Okay, welcome everyone um, to today's live stream. Uh, my name is Thomas Maurer. I'm a cloud advocate at Microsoft, and I hope you can hear me now. Let's just uh, figure this out. This is the first time I'm doing this, uh, kind of like a watch party. So that sounds good. Perfect. So people seem to be it seems to be working. That's awesome. I had a little bit of troubles uh, with the timer. It just froze, the screen froze for some reason. Um, so I'm happy to see you. We have a couple of people on the stream. Uh, again, this is going to be kind of like a viewing party. We're going to watch a video we recorded for the event called IT Ops Talks All Things Hybrid. And I'm going to show you a little bit uh, what that is. Uh, so let me move this over. So we created that event, our team, the team I'm working in, we created that event. Um, uh, with the intention to basically create some uh, deep level content on the hybrid cloud topic, right? Um, so uh, again, super happy. Thank you for the feedback with the sound. Super happy about that. Um, so we created that event uh, and it, the idea was really give you some deep dive sessions, like really not just like, hey, here is something new and we're gonna quickly show you a little bit about it. We want to really give the program managers as well, like a platform to go into some of the technical topics and show a little bit more than we usually show uh, during other events, right? So we created that event here. You can see that I'm zooming in a little bit. That is our blog, our IT Ops Talk uh, blog. And that is, we exist for a long time, but you can also see that we have all the sessions listed here. So we have sessions around Azure Lighthouse, about backup, about SMB. Um, so we have NetPile, for example, talking about that. Uh, we have a couple of more sessions on, for example, Azure Arc. Uh, so I had one about uh, enabled, like Azure Arc enabled servers and how you can manage your servers in a hybrid environment. We had uh, about Azure Arc um, databases session, like uh, or data services session. Very interesting session. It's like I like the title as well. Um, basically saying that databases are cattle too, not just your servers are cattle, you should also treat your databases like cattle. And so uh, it was very interesting to talk with Travis Wright uh, about that. And then obviously our team did awesome sessions. Anthony here uh, did a couple of security sessions. We had Pierre and um, uh, Sarah and obviously Sonia and Oren talking about lots of different, with lots of different program managers. And uh, so I want to watch one specific session. Um, again, you can find the whole list here or on our YouTube channel. So we have a YouTube channel. It's not this one. It's IT Ops Talk. And there you can obviously find a playlist um, for our uh, event. And so you can see here, we also have Mark Rusinovich doing a keynote for that event um, where he talked about all things hybrid and how cool hybrid is. So that was also a very interesting one. That one. I saw, and obviously I saw my own sessions <laughs> because I recorded them. But then we have, again, lots of interesting sessions from my teammates. And the one we are here for today is actually the PowerShell deep dive sessions. So let's have a quick look here. Hello, folks. Um, and uh, so before we start with that, that is Pierre Romont. He is uh, in, our, in the same team as I am, and he recorded together with Jason Helmick uh, and Joey. Uh, you basically know Chase, and I'm pretty sure if you haven't have worked with PowerShell before, I'm sure uh, his name popped up uh, in there. And he now works for Microsoft, so um, he is now in the program uh, in the product group for PowerShell. And does some pretty cool things, so I'm really looking forward uh, to that session. So I think we just start watching. And again, if there is anything you comment on, let's let's watch that together, right? That's the whole the whole point, the whole idea of it uh, is to watch it together. Welcome to Ops 117. I am here with Joey Aiello and Jason Helmick. I pronounced that right, did I? Yeah, you got it. All right. Yeah, you see, I'm not the only one who has troubles with names. So it's uh, it's also, also Pierre. Yeah, you got it. All right. So today we're going to discuss PowerShell, most likely PowerShell 7. Maybe a little bit of the uh, the uh, original PowerShell Windows PowerShell, but for that, I'm going to give it to uh, Joey. So, Joey, exactly, what are we going to talk about today, and how deep are we going to get? Uh, thank you so much, Pierre. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, primarily PowerShell Seven. Uh, what is it? 
how do you get it? What's it for? Uh, how to learn PowerShell with PowerShell. So we're really starting uh, for those folks that are, are, are not super experienced with PowerShell. Might might be your first time. You may, may not even know what PowerShell brings to the table. Uh, but then we're going to be going through some new stuff, uh, primarily some new modules that we're putting out uh, that work great with PowerShell 7. Uh, they're going to make your life a lot easier, especially if you are already an existing PowerShell user. So there's going to be plenty of new fancy stuff for those of you embedded in in the community and, and on the cutting edge of PowerShell. That's perfect. All right, that sounds like a pretty cool um, uh, agenda, to be honest. Like, I mean, I, obviously, I, I have invested a little bit in PowerShell 7 before, so I, I know a little bit what, what's going on there. But still, there's I'm sure there's a lot of a ton of stuff I have no clue about. Uh, because I obviously I like I'm not a super heavy PowerShell uh, guy at the moment, so um, we'll see what what's interesting. But I I see also like secret management that is pretty new. I'm really looking forward to that, and uh, I think one of the most interesting parts is because secret management is also one of them. It's like cross platform. So let's see see what they have to do. By the way, do you see like the camera of Pierre? How awesome the camera is! Just like in, on his in his side, you have to watch that. Perfect. Oh, yeah, so cool. let's let's get right into it. Yeah, so why PowerShell? What is PowerShell in the first place? And, and you know, if, if I'm not using PowerShell today, what, what's it really for? Uh, so PowerShell is a framework and a language that's designed uh, primarily for IT pros to manage their, uh, their on-premise infrastructure, their cloud infrastructure. It's also uh, very well suited for DevOps scenarios. Those of you with, you know, continuous integration and continuous deployment pipelines, um, anyone doing any sort of automated uh, application testing, um, as well as development workflows, right? So even as a local tool on your dev box uh, or as an IT pro, uh, it's something that just, you know, for power users makes life a lot easier in terms of managing things on your file system, uh, you know, managing your, your personal machine, et cetera. So, you know, PowerShell really spans the gamut of all these scenarios. And really, if you're someone who uh, likes to avoid uh, doing manual tasks repetitively, uh, PowerShell is probably for you. So one of the primary things that differentiates PowerShell uh, between other shells uh, like it, uh, something like Bash or CMD, is that PowerShell deals primarily in objects, right? So instead of uh, emitting text as its, as its form of output, while you do see text on the screen, uh, you, you get these nice fancy objects that have properties on them, they have methods, uh, they allow you to sort and search by fields rather than using really fancy regular expressions uh, or awk or set or grep um, as parsing tools uh, to sort of work through the text-based output that you would typically get on uh, a bash or, or CMD uh, style shell. So I think I think that is that is one of the well, one of the reasons why I love PowerShell because it's like really object oriented as I mentioned and it, it's like it's so much easier if you do some scripting and you need to work with multiple things like if you do for each loops and stuff like that. It's so much easier. Um, it's so much nicer to write code. Uh, I really like that. By the way, um, I started, I think, with PowerShell. Like, I was not sure if it's PowerShell one or two. I mean, one was was there, but I don't think many people really like. There was not many super good use cases to use it. But then with PowerShell two and three, I think I got very excited. And then back then, I was a sys administrator at the service provider, and I wrote a lot of PowerShell script to automate the environment. So I would be interested, like people, uh, What? Uh, by the way, obviously, hi to Andrew, Abu, Kayo, Luis. Uh, thank you for all for joining. So what what was kind of like your version of like, what, what version of PowerShell did you start? Like your first, I don't know, let's say like your first script or something. Um, that would be interesting. So, uh, similarly, uh, we've got this verb noun pattern uh, that makes commandlets very discoverable, right? So PowerShell is sort of this tool where you, you can kind of uh, feel around and get an idea of how things work, uh, even even if you're not reading the documentation and even if you've never used a tool before. So you've got this very consistent, you know. Do you realize, is, is Pierre frozen, by the way? Is like his camera frozen? Because he doesn't move at all. <laughs> Does someone else see that? Get command, get network adapter. It's very verbose uh, and and uh, a way to, to really describe what you're doing. Um, in, in sort of plain English, right? So PowerShell scripts are very readable for those of you that uh, maybe are first-time programmers, uh, first-time writing uh, any kind of script, and, and you just want to sort of read this thing from top to bottom, it, it's going to make... Uh... Pierre also looks very angry. I mean, really? 
And he's, by the way, a super nice guy. So he doesn't look the, that face. He should smile a little bit more because he's, he's a super funny guy. Um, I love the team meetings with him. So just want to mention that quickly. Uh, in a reasonable sense, what that script does, um, even if you're not necessarily a PowerShell group. Um, and then finally, you have an extremely wide set of modules available for different specific tasks. So we've got the PowerShell gallery where over 8,000 modules are hosted. You know, these are used for managing all sorts of different systems across different operating systems, clouds, on-premise environments. And then, uh, you know, if that's not enough, you've got all of .NET available for use uh, to fall back to, which is a, an extremely large, stable, robust, performance set of APIs uh, that are typically used in C-sharp or F-sharp, but can also be leveraged from within PowerShell. That's perfect. Okay. Sounds good. So... For those of you who do know a little bit about PowerShell, maybe you've been using that good old blue shell window inside of Windows for the last 10 years. You were a big fan of Monad, uh, and, and you've tracked with PowerShell this whole time. So what's going on with this other PowerShell, and why are there two PowerShells? Well, the traditional PowerShell that you I think I think I, I I cannot remember how many times I got this question. Like, what? Why is there still like? Where's this Windows PowerShell and why? Why is this PowerShell Seven? I got this question like a ton of times. Uh, we know as Windows PowerShell, right? So this is the one that's built into the operating system. It's built on the traditional .NET framework uh, today. That's uh, something like 4.8.x, um, and it's it's you know it's it's right there available to you as PowerShell.exe inside of a Windows. Windows Server machine. Um, given that, it works very well with these sort of traditional or legacy modules, many of which are, are still uh, built into Windows, uh, many of which may have been de developed years ago, shipped with various on-premise products. And, and really, um, you know, this is a PowerShell where we specifically want to keep it very stable, right? And the idea here is for all those workloads you have, just like you're still probably have a couple batch scripts hanging around inside of your environment that you've got to run inside of CMD, um, you're probably going to have scripts that, you know, into the foreseeable future will need Windows PowerShell and or the .NET framework to continue working, right? And, and given that, we really want to park it in a maintenance, right? So it still gets security updates. Um, you can still trust it as an inbox application. Uh, it works great for all those workloads, um, but it's not going to be getting any new features. And, uh, you know, this is really something where we're trying to keep it as is so that uh, all of these existing uh, workloads continue to work as they have for the last, you know, however many years. Um, I, I, by the way, I love how they did uh, like highlight the PowerShell 7 with like some star emojis. I think, I think that is, that, that really does make a, make a lot of, uh, it inspires me to use it more. Like, yeah, <laughs> no, but yeah. So let's see. Similarly, Windows PowerShell is built around WinRM-based remoting. Uh, and so, you know, for those of you that have used Enter PS Session uh, and you use that with WinRM, um, that is the, the really the only remoting protocol available there on Windows PowerShell. Fast forward to PowerShell Core and PowerShell 7, as we now know it. Uh, PowerShell Core 6 was around for a little while, now out of support, been completely superseded by PowerShell 7, uh, which is awesome because PowerShell 7 works on Windows, Mac OS and Linux. Um, it's fully side by side with Windows PowerShell and actually with other versions of PowerShell 7 if you'd like to you know, have a couple different uh, versions on your machine for testing. Um, we've got Docker containers. It's in the Ubuntu Snap Store. Um, you know, there's, we, we've put it in as many places as possible to make it as easy as possible to pick up um, so that you know, when you're ready to make that leap uh, to Windows PowerShell, not only can you find it anywhere, but it's it's also you're going to be able to take baby steps um, in terms of you know testing PowerShell seven out in, in smaller quantities um, with with newer workloads, right? And so um, this is built around .NET Core uh, or .NET five plus. Uh, as I think I think the one of the, the the things why it's so fast is exactly that reason because it's based like based on .NET Core. Um, I think that is. Like it's so crazy fast if you compare it with some of the traditional Windows PowerShell pass um, uh, things. So that that is that is pretty insane. So if you, I don't know how, who of you is using Windows PowerShell versus PowerShell Seven, um, but that would be definitely interesting to see. Um, so let me know. It's now known. Uh, it's going to continue to six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Um, highly compatible with modern modules. So any of new modules that Microsoft is producing. 
uh, are compatible with PowerShell 7. Uh, but we've also got this awesome backwards compatibility layer on Windows that allows it to call into Windows PowerShell for those modules that are not available. So, um, you, quick question. So, if we've please. written, if we've written uh, PowerShell, and our audience, uh, everybody's watching right now, uh, who's been working uh, in any environments for a number of years, and uh, we've got this legacy of of PowerShell scripts that we're using for login scripts, for setting up server, for deploying workstations, for managing environments. Like, does that, like, if I've got these old scripts, can I just run them on PowerShell seven? You should be able to run them on PowerShell 7. Um, I will say that there are a couple caveats. There's a couple gotchas from a compatibility perspective. But generally speaking, especially if you're still using those on Windows and you still have access to Windows PowerShell, PowerShell 7 is going to intelligently call out the Windows PowerShell under the hood without, you know, very invisibly um, for those commandlets that may still be incompatible with PowerShell 7. So we bridge the I, f I think that was that was very important. I remember that in PowerShell Core 6, when they first introduced, you kind of like had like some workarounds to use Windows PowerShell commandlets. And the problem really was like you had commandlets, you had modules, but they were not working in PowerShell Core 6. Uh, and then like you were like, OK, well, what do I do then with PowerShell Core 6 if everything I wrote in the past like in Windows PowerShell 5.1 doesn't really Kind of like some often doesn't work anymore or even don't have the commandlets anymore available and then when they came out with uh, powershell 7 i think that uh <laughs> changed a lot was a lot of game changer to actually use powershell 7 and a newer version based on dotnet core yeah here in such a way that for you uh you can just use powershell 7 as that entry point for all automation um and then windows powershell is sort of leveraged as this uh sort of back-end compatibility component when necessary but we're, we're steadily increasing the number of commandlets uh, that are natively supported in PowerShell 7 so that this is unnecessary. Um, we're at about 70% of all the modules in Windows are, are fully compatible. Uh, and we've got a link here at the end of the presentation uh, for you to find out more information on which modules those are. But Perfect. the side-by-side -side nature of PowerShell 7 means that you can go and test one script at a time, take those baby steps, make sure that nothing's gonna break, um, and and you know you don't have to impact your existing Windows PowerShell workloads or make a switch over all at one time. Oh, okay, that's perfect. You know, Peter, uh, the one thing I want to point out that that Joey um, uh, started with on here is something to keep in mind. If you're really comfortable with Windows PowerShell and you're used to opening up console and launching PowerShell, even typing PowerShell.exe, when yep. you bring down PowerShell Seven. So that we get that side-by-side -side capability, the executable is different. So if you type PowerShell, you're not going to get what you think. What you really want to type is PWSH. And that's the yes. .exe that we're using now, and that's what gives us side-by-side. -side. I've actually gotten caught uh, doing that a, a bunch of times already. So I learned that. Yeah. Actually, now I've got shortcuts everywhere, but that's yeah. beside the point. <laughs> yeah, and we have differentiated the icon as well uh, for those of you that have a bunch of taskbar shortcuts. Um, so we've actually got a, a black icon now. Um, the background by default is black. And then we additionally, we even ship a PowerShell 7 preview um, that's got uh, our fancy mascot that you saw here on the last slide as the, uh, the, the, the parallelogram icon uh, so that you can, can at a glance know whether you're using the preview versus the stable version. So uh, I, I really think, like, I mean, I haven't, to be fair, I have, like, at the beginning, yes, I used the shortcuts, but I, I mean, since we have, let me double check here. Uh, that was wrong. Since we have terminal here, uh, I should write it correctly. Like the Windows terminal. I don't know. I don't know who is using the Windows terminal, who is watching right now. But I think that is that is the like. It's it, it it made me so happy when we brought out that preview, and then now we have a stable version of it in Windows 10. It makes me so happy. And then having that list, like so, I can run Windows PowerShell, and I can also like have PowerShell 7 like here, right, right there, side by side, and I can customize. And you can see here, like I can design, change designs I want. I think. Um, well, I have, Andrew, I think he means he refers to like desktop shortcuts, like uh, having different icons if you type PowerShell. I think, uh, but again, I would, I would really like. I, I just love Windows Terminal. I think 
if you haven't used it, please try it. I mean, it's such a makes things so much easier. That far and, and uh, you know, use use all those fancy icons. Um, so obviously, there's a ton of new features in Powershell Seven, and there's really too many for me to list here. But we've got integrated parallelism, loads of new command lists, all kinds of new language features and operators, um, SSH based remoting. Obviously, the ability to deploy on Docker or across all these other operating systems is huge, um, and, and there's just so much more. So you'll want to check out the PowerShell 6 and 7 release notes for you know, a, a more comprehensive list of these things. Um, a, a big one are, are web, uh, web commandlets and, and JSON commandlets are massively improved uh, to be more compatible with all the world's REST APIs. So there's, just, there's a ton of stuff in there, and I urge you, if you're doing any kind of modern IT uh, or DevOps, uh, development, you should absolutely uh, check out PowerShell 7 to avoid a lot of the kind of snags that that uh, folks have run into over the years with Windows. Perfect. The people watching, do you have any favorite PowerShell 7 features? Like, what are your favorite new features? I mean, I know there are a couple of, of, of them, but like, let's post them in the chat if you have uh, so, some favorite features. So moving along, uh, we're just going to hop right into uh, how to learn PowerShell with PowerShell. So again, this is for those of you that uh, may just be beginning your PowerShell journey. Um, and, and we're just going to go ahead and hop in uh, to a terminal right here. So the first thing uh, that we want to do. Windows terminal, just saying. Is uh, make sure that uh, my notes are available to me. Uh, because while I have done this a thousand times, I always, uh, <laughs> when presenting, will miss a little, a little bit here. So one of the first things to note about PowerShell is... Did you see the mean laugh of uh, Jason? I, he was like, I don't need notes. No notes at all. There is a lot of... Uh, right? So uh, you know, something like get command, right? I can just uh, use tab at the end of this, and that's going to just complete... Uh, my, my command. So if there are multiple options, I can continue hitting tab, and that's going to continue rotating through through more and more of these. So if I go ahead and run git command, you'll see this verb dash noun pattern everywhere. There's a million functions on my machine. Um, and so the question is, how do I really parse these down? I'm trying to accomplish a specific task. What's the best way to do that, right? So, um, so uh, you know, I, I'm going to use uh, get command and then some wild cards to get a little bit closer in terms of what it is I'm specifically looking for. So let's say, you know, I know I want something to do with Azure, um, and I know I want uh, something to do with Azure networking, right? So I'm just going to go ahead and say get command star, az star, net star. And that just means any characters in between uh, where those wild cards are, show me, show me everything that matches that. So you'll see, you know, I have a bunch of these, az virtual network, right? And so... Okay, great. Let's say I want to create a new AZ network interface. All right, so I'm just going to go ahead and copy that command. Or even better, I'll use tab completion. Uh, or not, because I'm going to use the, let's say, a new AZ virtual map. This is great. So, got this command, get help, right? And so, get help, again, this is learning PowerShell with PowerShell. I can pass this command name to get help, and I'm actually going to get. Uh, this is very interesting documentation. This is going to be a summary of the documentation. Uh, sometimes this takes just a second for the help system to do some caching. But you'll see, you know, I've got these parameters available to me, the types uh, that those parameters uh, want to accept. Um, you know, we've got a description. Uh, obviously, the new AZ virtual network command creates an Azure virtual network. I would hope so. Um, but it says, hey, if you want the full help, you know, you're going to want to go ahead and type get help. Uh, new AZ virtual network dash full. So I'm going to go ahead and hit up. From working with PowerShell, get help. The most important command you will ever learn in your lifetime. Like, get help is the command that you want to, to know. Command line, um, to see uh, the, the previous command that I just typed, and I'm going to put in that dash full. And you'll see I get a much longer set of documentation, right? So this actually includes examples, uh, throughout, we've got uh, inputs, parameter descriptions, right? Key value pairs in the form of a hash table. For example, here's how you would you know, use dash tag, right? So all this information's in here. But maybe I don't want it in my terminal. Maybe it'd be nice if I actually pop up a window here uh, locally. 
Unfortunately, this one only works on Windows due to some limitations with how uh, graphical interfaces work uh, on uh, PowerShell 7, but you'll see I got a little window pop up here. It's now searchable, um, all the same exact information available uh, inside of a little window pop up. But regardless of what operating system you're on, you can also use, I'm going to make sure this is the browser that this is going to pop up in, uh, and we're going to see all this goodness in a minute here. But um, if I use Dash Online instead of Show Window, I'm going to see documentation available right there on the web. So this is always going to be the most up-to-date version. I've got fancy formatting here. I can even use Cloud Shell to automatically try this from this documentation. So you know, this information is everywhere, uh, highly discoverable, really a great way to, again, sort of explore what's available to you within PowerShell modules uh, uh, from PowerShell. Right? So, Similarly, uh, you know, if I want to see all of the modules available on a machine, the module is a list of section of analysts. I'm going to go ahead and type module dash list available, and that's going to show me all of the available uh, modules that are installed on my machine. Again, this takes a second sometimes due to uh, uh, caching. It's uh, it's cheaper on all subsequent runs within this session. Uh, but this is going to show me, and it also takes longer the more modules you have installed on your machine. And I have a lot of modules. Well, I assume you've got them all, or pretty close to that. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, not quite all the 8,000. I'm a little surprised here if it's taking so long. I suspect it might have something to do with the screen. Did he just say that there are 8,000 modules for PowerShell? Is that, like, the number? or the, like Because that's insane. So you see all these Azure modules, right? These are in different locations. A bunch of these are the ones that are built into Windows. You'll see... These are actually all of the built-in Windows PowerShell modules uh, that are compatible with Core. So this PS edition says that these are all, you know, I can manage my DNS client or my then adapter, right? And all of that natively works on uh, PowerShell 7. So a ton of modules available to me, and then I can, you know, if I want to see something for a specific module, I can get command and manage module and my adapter, and great, I've got, uh, you know, this set of commandlets associated with that. Um, Partial is not case sensitive, so you can see I, I take the case wrong. It doesn't matter. A lot of these tab complete really great. Um, the last thing I'm going to show just really quick is uh, the ability to find modules on the PowerShell gallery. So if I switch over here, um, you'll see, you know, we've got PowerShellGallery.com, which again has over 8,000 modules. You know, maybe I want a module for managing YAML. It's very popular. And there are a number of these. Um, you know, so I can similarly search. Just like I did uh, in get module, I can use find module, and that's going to go up to the gallery. It's going to ask it, hey, are there any modules um, that have this YAML keyword inside the title? Um, this may take a moment because of my lovely network access, um, but I assure you that this is going to return the same set of results that we just saw there on the web. And then I can subsequently use the install dash module command to install something um, like. PowerShell dash YAML, right? So I can actually take this and set a you know, install dash module. Uh, we'll go with this one since it's above a one. I don't, I don't actually know if that means it's in Git, but I'm sure it's great. Um, so you'll see this means it brings it into my own space and I've got uh, a module there. Now, you know, we do our best to uh, make sure that there's nothing malicious in the PowerShell gallery, but if you're playing in the production, as always, big disclaimer. Uh, make sure you do inspect the, the module itself and make sure that it does do what you think it does uh, before using it in a production environment. And that Lastly, you trust the source. Yes, that you trust the source. Uh, I mean, most of these are open source because a lot of them are written in PowerShell scripts, so trusting the source may be uh, you know, simply reading the source yourself. But yes, if you trust the author and the person who published it, um, you know, then, then you may choose to forgo that. It's actually a, it's actually a good point. I mean, I... Uh, if you are in an enterprise environment, you probably don't want to trust like every every source out there, right? You just you cannot just go out to like any hosting platform where you can actually find the module and just import that and start using it with your PowerShell. So you you probably want to trust uh, that that PowerShell repository. And I know that you can also run your own PowerShell gallery, basically like your own inside, like your probably your company internal one. So you could, for example 
build your own PowerShell modules and build your own gallery so your developers and IT pros can actually work it or you can use it for your uh, DevOps processes and stuff like that. So so that's pretty cool. I think the whole module part is awesome. I, I'm just still blown away by the numbers of PowerShell modules which are in the PowerShell gallery right now. I think that is, that is just insane. Um, uh, I remember, I think when we started, we really had a couple, like mostly the built-in ones, and then some people uh, wrote a couple of modules at the beginning, but like far from 100 modules, I think, at the beginning. I, I cannot even remember exactly how much, but 8,000 is insane. That uh, manual first. So lastly, I just want to show, you know, PowerShell 7. This is this is where it lives here on github.com slash PowerShell slash PowerShell. There's a ton of good information here about the differences between Windows PowerShell and PowerShell Core or 7. Um, all the different platforms you can see that we're available on, um, you know, where the preview releases are available, uh, binary archive, all these things, our community dashboard, so much more. If you're having any issues in PowerShell 7, you should hop over here, file an issue, let us know. Um, we also take code contributions uh, in the form of pull requests, and we've got a ton of community members who are just amazing in terms of submitting all that. Uh, and then finally, uh, this page is AKMS slash install PowerShell. This is going to give you all the information based on which operating system, platform distribution you're installing on, how you're going to install PowerShell 7 in the most supported way, uh, and what your options are. So definitely give all that a look as you uh, look into moving your workloads to PowerShell 7. I, I just see like uh, Pierre is actually in the chat and actually watching. That's that's awesome. So I have to be careful what I now say about his haircut and stuff like that. But uh, <laughs> uh, but it's also he just mentioned that like sometimes he asked question what the audience would be interested in or what he is interested in, and I think I think that is one of the fun things. I did the same. So like I was mostly like listening to the in, in listening to the presenters and program managers, and I was like, holy crap, that's interesting. So I need to actually ask something about that and I want to know more. Uh, I think I had to at one point cut out the question because I asked something where obviously like which was uh, a little bit NDA uh, but uh, no that's I, I know the feeling Pierre I know the feeling. That's great. Which back over to our PowerPoint here. Yeah well we're really excited. It's been a few years now of the PowerShell core and it's really come into itself uh, as a very viable replacement uh, for Windows PowerShell and something where all of the awesome automation innovation is, is really happening. So. That's perfect. Yeah, so I want to uh, hand it over to uh, my accomplice, my partner in crime here, Jason Hel You see the excited excitement in Pierre's face that we are now past the getting started PowerShell stuff and actually now going into some fancy new stuff, basically. And uh, let's see what's coming. Uh, who's going to be talking? about some, some new additions that we've been made to tab completion uh, to make PowerShell even more intelligent. Uh, so I, I want to hand it over to you, Jason. Go ahead and take it away. Yeah, so um, you know, Joey was just showing some tab completion, how you can start a command, hit tab, and it completes it for you. And we do tab completion on parameters to help you out as well. That's great, PowerShell teaching you PowerShell. But Pierre, I, I have a question for you. I want you yeah. to think about something. If what if you could recall and instantly do any skill or anything that you have ever learned in your life, you had instant memory for everything you've learned and every skill you've done. Would that be worth something to you, Pierre? Absolutely. I'd have <laughs> I really want to know Pierre's answer to this because uh yeah, absolutely. I think it's gonna not just gonna cut it. <laughs> Exactly. We'd all get Joey's job. Well, here's the thing. PowerShell is going to continue to help you in a variety of ways. Let me show you my desktop. I'm going to bring up PowerShell, and I'm running one of our, our latest preview versions that we're working towards for 7.2. And I, I want to show you something that PowerShell can do. PowerShell knows everything you've done. So when you start typing today, we have a new feature called predictive intelligence that you can enable that will remind you of everything that you've already done. So I'm going to try to do uh, get child item and and get a list of things on my, my, my file system. So I'm going to start typing get child. And as you can see in the green color, it's already predicted. Holy crap. Okay, that that is pretty cool. 
am I actually supposed to say that on on um, on the live stream? I don't know, but um, this is really really cool. And you get child item for me, but I'd like to do with it. It's getting this from my history. So if I've done something before, it remembers it and it brings it up on screen. The benefit to this is I can immediately, that's what I wanted. I can accept it and I can execute it. So maybe, and I'm going to clear my screen, maybe I started typing get child item and I'm like, I can't remember all what I did with the pipeline and what I did with sort and select, this reminds you and you can choose the thing from your history that gives you the best representation. Let me show you this. I'm gonna say, you know what? This I want part of this, but I, I there was something I had done earlier. It wasn't a select. I think I was sorting some information. So I'm gonna start to type sort. It, will con it continuously checks your history for when you're typing to see if it can make a match. And in this case, it, it found the match for a sort. I'm off to the races and executing. Now look, okay. if you've worked with PowerShell, especially Windows PowerShell before, you notice that if you run commands like get history, I think that's the first time I've ever typed that correctly, by the way. Um, <laughs> this history is 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 session based. This is the PowerShell history and these commands used that was based upon your session. So when I close this session, all of this information I just want to say, like, I mean, I mean, this this feature, like the, the intelligence thing, it's it's awesome. Like, um, imagine if you work like on your machine, and then you need to run, for example, commands multiple times against different remote servers, um, and then you obviously like like run it. Maybe if you run it like five times after each other, I mean, that's fine, right? But then, like, maybe two hours later or two three days later, you need to run the same thing again, and then I need to go and copy somewhere from a notepad or wherever I have it. And if it just remembers, I just, wow, I'm, I'm, I really hope, the only, my only hope now for this feature is now that it also works when you do a remoting session. So when I'm in a remoting sessions that my local machine obviously keeps, like, keeps that his, also in the history. And then I'm able to run it against multiple remote, in multiple remote sessions. So let's see. It goes away. But the yep. history that we're using for predictions is from PS Read Line. That's one of the modules that allows us um, to run the, the, the predictions. And that history file is all your history across sessions. So as you learn and as you do things correctly, PowerShell is going to remember what you did and then provide you information. But Pierre, you know what? This is, this is where it gets really cool. What I just oh, showed it gets you, it gets cooler. Is that what you're telling it me? Even gets cooler. Yeah, it even gets cooler. So as you see, what I'm doing here, now I'm doing this on PowerShell Seven. Well, okay. and sorry, Jason, what was the uh, what was the sh the shortcut on the keyboard you're using to actually complete that uh, at the end when you got oh. to sort? Oh, thank you so much, uh, Joey. So when I want to accept this entire prediction, the stuff you see in green is the prediction. If I just want to accept all this, I'm hitting the right arrow key to accept okay. it. I can use. And by the way. You can redefine these keys to whatever you desire. But right now, the keys by default are set up that if I wanted to, uh, let's say I'm starting a prediction and I want to move forward or backward, I can use Control F to move forward. I can use Control B to move backward. So I can make adjustments. I can edit this and find other predictions that may match better for me. Nice. Now, one thing, though, I think that just blows people's minds away, this this is cool, but wait, it's only cool if I can use it where I need it. I'm yeah. on PowerShell 7. Okay, so Pierre in the comments means it's gonna be, I should keep watching because it gets even cooler. I'm definitely definitely gonna do that. If that's true, I I mean, I'm already blown away by this. I'm actually on a preview for 7.2 right now on Windows. Well, but what if you're somebody that uses, oh, let me grab it here. What if you're somebody that uses Windows PowerShell? Well, here's the thing, and then we're going to give you some links for this, and I'll show you how to uh, where you can get this from. But take a look; it works on Windows PowerShell 5.1 as well. So if you're using Windows PowerShell and you haven't gone to PowerShell 7, boy, we really wish you would go to PowerShell 7. But it works on Windows too. Not only does it work on Windows, but hang on a second, I'm going to flip over to my Mac. I'm going to bring up my Mac, and I'm going to start typing. You see, I get a prediction on my Mac. So it works cross-platform, just like PowerShell 7. That's part of the goodness of PowerShell 7 working cross-platform. Now, uh, 
the only thing I just realized is pretty scary. I think when you do presentations and you're gonna do like a PowerShell command and you need to do some like a demo, a PowerShell demo in your um, thing, that is gonna be uh, <laughs> interesting to see what comes up on many many co people's uh, computers. However, I mean, I mean, uh, I'm sure you can turn it off. This is good, but we've we've also gone a little bit further because. What we wanted to do was modernize and then go to the next gen of shells. So to modernize our shell, this is very similar right now to what you might have seen if you worked with Rust or with Z shell, their suggestions that they give you. So we've modernized to meet that, but we wanted to go a little bit further. So one of the problems is, is as I'm typing, I might want to see some of the other options that are in my history. So we give you an easy key press. You press F2. And now you get this new display for predictions that we call, call list view. The other view we refer to as inline, only one line. This is list view and you can, oh, wait a minute, I see that sort that I want. So you can, you can use the down arrow, you can select it. You see the line uh, where my prompt is, is changing to match. I can strike enter, I'm off to the races. That that is view, that is so much better than up arrow down arrow for the list of commands that I've been typing in for the last three hours. You know what? Here, I told you you were gonna like this. <laughs> I predict you're gonna like it even more when I get done. So just so that you can see that this also this extended view having list view also works on Windows PowerShell, also works on Linux. All of that is good. Here's what this does for you. If you've done something before successfully, this will accelerate you to getting it done again and refresh your memory. So that's an right. experienced PowerShell user that's accomplished a lot. Well, I don't know about Pierre's memory, but yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Pierre. This is a huge accelerator to make, making your future life a little bit easier and better. But, you know, Joey was talking about you know, PowerShell teaching you PowerShell and, you know, you have to get help to teach you how to use the system and how to use commandlets and how things work. I really like that premise that PowerShell is trying to help you along the way. So I want to show you something else. Now, this is currently being worked on. So this is work currently in preview that we're, we're working on and I need to make a change. I'm going to change my, oh, thank you, predictive intelligence. I'm going to change something called the prediction source, which is right now only using history. I'm going to change this to use something called history and plugin. And this is where additional folks, whether they're from Microsoft or from outside of Microsoft, can write their own predictors. And what I'd like to show you is, is I have a predictor written by one of our internal teams, our friend, as a matter of fact, that Joey and I work with, Damien Caro, over the Azure PowerShell team. I know Damien well. Yeah. So... So what he did, Pierre, is he put together, using our prediction engine, he put together an ML-based predictor for Azure PowerShell. Now, what this does is I haven't successfully done anything with Azure PowerShell. I'm not even exactly sure what to do. All I know is, is I want to make a new V. <laughs> okay, that, that was funny. Yeah. Well, with that knowledge, if you know a little bit about PowerShell, you know, you can probably type new then you can probably put in and the az commandlets i'll begin with az mm -hmm. and i want to make a new vm you can already see that the the predictor for azure powershell is predicting not only the command that i want to use but the parameters and it tells me that i need some arguments for that but here's the interesting thing take a look at the one that i have suggested i want to you create a new VM. One of the first things I notice is that to create a new VM, sure, I can give it a name and all that kind of stuff, but it needs a resource group. Oh, wait a minute. I'm not even sure I really understand what a resource group is, but I'll trust it. So let me back up a little bit, back, back up a lot, and let me just see a new AZ. How do I make a resource group? Right there. Oh, that's what I want. Oh. Okay. That... That is that is very cool. That kind of like reminds me 
a little bit at least from the Azure CLI where you have also like this AI technology where you can actually like use AC find and then type whatever you want and then you get the right command or the right documentation for, for what you want to do. Uh, in fact, this is way cool. Now I'm on the line, I can make the resource group. It taught me what to do to make the resource group then it's teaching me what parameters, what arguments do I need so that I can be successful at making the VM. An interesting thing here. Now, I didn't have, I'm not actually connected to Azure right now, so I didn't expect it to work. But here's what I want you to notice. The arguments that are typed in here for the resource group, it's name and it's location, this kind yep. of stuff. We are going to reuse that so that later when you want to create the VM and put it in your resource group, we're going to auto-populate that argument for you. We're going to try to help you fill this stuff out as you go so okay. that you have a better experience. So what we're doing with these predictions is we're helping you accelerate where you've already been successful and on new technologies where you might be, I'm not sure how to use this. We're basically giving you the examples on the screen, examples that have been modified to get you into action sooner. So, Pretty cool. You want to know how to get it, Pierre? Yes, I do. Absolutely. <laughs> so, so it's just like maybe I missed that. But so the predictions. Where do the predictions come from? Like for him now, for example, it gives him the prediction for like let's say location, and then it gives him the Azure region, Central US, or something like that. Uh, do the prediction come from just general documentation, or does it come like real? Like I know that some parts, like the the autocomplete, is obviously your personal one. But the predictor, does it, that, that would be interesting to know. <laughs> An easy setup question, right? So let me just show you. Using a PowerShell get find module, um, <laughs> this makes my life a lot easier. Uh, I'm going to switch to uh, my list view here really quick. It's PS read line. OK. And let me just tell you right now, today, if you were going to grab this, as soon as it comes up and, and shows me my PS Readline, version 2.1 of PS Readline has what I've been showing you so far of uh, being able to type in and being able to see the list view. This version also works on Windows PowerShell 5.1, and of course it's cross-platform. If you want to be able to work with additional plugins, that requires that you be on PowerShell 7 because okay. we had to add some new components to the PowerShell engine that don't exist in Windows PowerShell to manage these plugins. So you got to be on PowerShell 7, but then you can add the plugins. And the version of PS Reline that's a module that's available to you today is let me just do allow. Thank you, predictor. <laughs> let me bring it up here. 2.2 beta 1. And this will be moving forward in our future previews as well, so that you'll be able to work with the predictors. If now, I wasn't recording the session, I'd be installing it right now. Um, and I, I do have I'm one gonna... question, though. Yeah. So. OK. Please. Please, Pierre. Please ask the right question. Please. You've mentioned this is across sessions and everything. However, uh, myself and I know a lot of our audience are probably in the same boat as well, where uh, I go to um, uh, Azure Shell. I use the Azure Shell a lot. Um, and then on some of my machine, I don't even have like PowerShell or uh, the Azure like CLI or anything installed. I just run the uh, Azure Shell container uh, locally and just kind of. You're, you're talking about that. cloud so shell always, here. Pardon me. Cloud. You're talking about cloud shell here. Yeah, Cloud Shell, sorry. Cloud Shell, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I use Cloud Shell, so it's got everything built in. So I want to install this, and that's great. But what if I jump from one machine to another or from one shell? Because when you're in the shell and the container disappears, whatever's in there also disappears. Uh, how do you deal with that? Or is that something that's even possible at this point? Quite. OK. OK, Pierre, that was a really good question. That is That I really want to know. And also. If they can also like, answer that, I know, I mean, it's recorded. I'm probably not going to answer me now. But does it also work when I use it in Visual Studio Code, like when I write scripts? Because that would also be awesome if that would be built in in the intelligence, intelligence sense of, uh, of the PowerShell extension in Visual Studio Code. But maybe we'll see that in a bit. Quite honestly, that's kind of by design. Because you think about this. If I'm sitting on this machine doing a lot of particular work, like I'm working with a lot of repos or Git, 
that's the history file that I've been using. So that's the history I'm going to get predicted to me. So when you switch machines, yeah, unless you, and you can do this, by the way, you could pick up that history file off of your current box and drop it onto another box. But yeah, if you switch to another box, the history is going to be different. When you're working, though, with an additional plugin, like I was just working with the Azure PowerShell plugin, those predictions, that comes from a magic server somewhere on the internet. And those predictions will come to you the same, regardless of which system you're on. So the historical based ones, yeah, those are system dependent, but the other ones, they're not. Okay, so I guess that means that the historical ones are like your personal ones and then the prediction ones, as you said, because it comes from the cloud somewhere. I don't think you need to log in somewhere. So it's probably just like generalized um, commands. It's like just what is in documentation or what other people are using and then gives you some ideas. So it will not take your regions in that sense for the predictions, but it will obviously for the generalized ones. However, I mean, Pierre's point is actually good. Um, like, if you want to move, like, I, for example, I always use Cloud Shell. I don't, like, you, well, most of the time I use Cloud Shell. And so all the, my personal predictions will be stored in the Cloud Shell one as well. So whenever I log in from different machines um, or from different browsers, I don't think I will have an issue. I will have my personal history always the same, as well as uh, uh, obviously my predictions. So that's, yeah, pretty cool. Okay, so there's there's no um, there's no facilities for me to say uh, for for the the PS read line to actually say store the uh, uh, history uh, on my cloud drive or on my OneDrive that so I've got it access from all of my machines. Not at this time, no. Nope. Not but at this you time. Okay. So if you wanted to, I th I think there actually is a fanciness here. If you will not mind, real quick, Jason, running get PS read line option. Um, what that's going to show us is actually where the history file is stored. And so theoretically, if you're the kind of person that brings, you'll see there, C users, JSON H, app data roaming. Yeah. If you're the kind of person that carries a, uh, your profile to every machine you have, you can set PS read line option against that history save path. Yeah. You could put it inside of your OneDrive and you could have a persistent profile uh, or a persistent history file across all the machines that are configured similarly to that. Um, I think I think Pierre just added a new feature um, <laughs> to to PowerShell. I would nice also hack. say that uh, yeah nice little, I just came up with that. That's you know we're just we're we're out here just being casual. Uh, That's right. Because I don't think anyone suggested that yet. That's a great idea. Um, but the you could also similarly Cloud Shell is going to have a persistent history because um, you know, you can set it to, or you could have it set in such a way that that history file is stored in the Azure blob storage that Cloud Shell mounts every time it starts up. That's right. Um, so similarly, you know, that's that's another way that you could have that file. And in fact, you may want to keep those separate. Like it might be that your Cloud Shell history is one history and your every other machine history is another one. So that's what I said. That's that's what I said. <laughs> All of that is totally configurable, and I think you could hack it together. Uh, you know, with all the right pieces, but I, I don't think we've heard that scenario. So this, I'm, I'm interested in that. One, yeah. <laughs> well, well, glad I could to help. Your point, to your point, Peter, see, this is why Joey doesn't need predictions because he never forgets anything. <laughs> 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 all right, that must be sarcasm because he had a list uh, written down somewhere with his demo. So I think that was sarcasm. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone on this call knows that it is not true that I never forget anything. I'm, I'm absolutely, uh, I have no idea what you're talking about, Joey. <laughs> but I will remember uh, right now uh, to remind Jason, would you mind showing us what module, let's say I've got PS Read Line 2.2 picked up, what module do I need to find and install in the gallery in order to get these amazing Azure predictions from the magic box in the sky? That is a wonderful question. So, <laughs> up Bing. Oh, well, I'm trying to open up Bing. Open up your favorite Bing search engine and come on. Can do I, I, I'm a fan of Bing 3. That's actually my favorite Bing. Yeah, my whatever reason. 
Look, folks, you're looking for the PowerShell Gallery. So you can find that also. It's just the PowerShellGallery.com. Wow. Come on. You can do it. You're big. There it goes. Screen sharing is pricey, folks. I just, I, by the way, I just want to mention when I look at all the, the internet troubles they are having, I just want to quickly mention that I now have a 10 gig uh, internet connection up and down. So just want to leave that in the room here. Upgrade your GPUs if you can find any that yeah. exist. Yeah, I, I, I've got so many uh, um, reminders when stock will be, and that's not happening anytime soon. Here you go. Go ahead and type. Once you get to the PowerShell gallery where all of the modules are, go ahead and type PS yep. Reline, and what you'll see when it goes out to it is. You'll but see I do need. Reline. I need one extra module if I want the Azure predictions to work, right? Yes, and so that was my let question. me show you yeah. that as well. So if you are looking for the Azure predictor, we will also give you a link to their blog if you forget this. But Azure Tools yep. Victor, the, 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 the links will be the, the links will be down here. Awesome. You can do it at the gallery and go to and grab it from here, AZ Tools Predictor, or you can, as you saw me doing earlier when I was doing a PS read line, you can find module AZ Tools Predictor. Okay, for everyone in the call, this is what you need. Like for the prediction, obviously, but and the PS read line. But so this find module ac dot tools dot predictor. Uh, no worries, I will also put some links in the description below. But this is what you need as well. Right? Oh, I'm sorry, you might have already shown that one, and I just missed it. No, I actually hadn't. Thank you, sir, for reminding me. Oh, okay. That's awesome. Cool, cool, cool. Um, so yeah, you can get PS Rewind. You get the AZ Tools Predictor. We're going to give you the links for this, so you you know in case you forget, get predictions so you don't have to worry about forgetting again. Um, that is yeah, fantastic. Super exciting. Yeah, I really I know that Pierre finds that's especially fantastic for him, like not forgetting things anymore. Yeah. <laughs> well, Pierre, besides predictions, was that kind of cool? Was that that, that was absolutely really cool? This uh, uh, it, it addresses so many pain points for me personally that I'm sure it uh, it'll it'll resonate with the audience as well. And and this predictor can be customized. The colors can be customized to get easier colors to read with, all of that. So check it out. I think you'll really enjoy it. I have to say, for those of us on the team that have been using this for several months, I I, I, I don't want to use a uh, PowerShell without it now. I mean, it's really ingrained. Um, it's great. Um, and when you talk about customizing colors, you're, you're really impressed me if you ever come up with a hot dog theme. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> oh, Pierre, Pierre, you were you were you did so well with your feature about the history sync and bring them up with the idea to sync the history file on a OneDrive uh, share. Um, I think you could just easily do a sim link or whatever. Uh, and now you come up with a hot dog theme. No, never <laughs> again. <laughs> well, one of the but other. If you topics, do have any Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, just, just before you move there, yeah. If, if you have any feedback on those default shortcuts, default colors, you know, you think that something could be improved, definitely make sure you hop over to the PS Readline repo, which will either be magically here or uh, at the end of the presentation here uh, to, to give us that feedback. We're in a... Sure, Pierre. Yeah, yeah. Just kidding, of course. Free release state so that we can, you know, fix those things before they end up shipping uh, as production modules. So please, please, uh, you know, try it out now. Give us that feedback before it's too late. I will be installing it this is the minute we uh, uh, finish uh, recording this session. Awesome. Well, let me double check how long the session still goes. Yeah, we still have hmm, still have an hour or something. So, Pierre, you still need to wait an hour, like, or needed to wait an hour. Let's put it that way. Let's switch topics for a second. And you, you, you use the ISC. Uh, so PowerShell, Windows PowerShell, comes with an editor built right into Windows called the, and I'm, I'm emphasizing this word for a reason, Pierre, Windows PowerShell ISC. ISC stands for Integrated Scripting Environment. And this is a great scripting editor for PowerShell. 
yep. on Windows. We love PISC, but it's on Windows. Did I say that before? Yeah, it's on Windows. And so here's part. Did he did he mention that it is on Windows? Because I didn't. Maybe I need to go back. Part of the challenge, PowerShell is a cross-platform product. Well, we need a cross-platform editor. That's most important. So when we look at the ISC, as much as we like the ISC, the problem is, is that there's a lot of features we want to add. We want to mm -hmm. add, working in DevOps, you need to be able to work with JSON files, Markdown, Get. There's all of these things that you want added, but we, we don't want to invest into this because it's only on Windows. So... We have this great new editor. Some of you may have already seen it. We have this great new editor. I'm going to show you how to get it first or where to get it. In Just go to Bing and type in Visual Studio Code. Yeah. And what will happen is, is you'll get to the website for Visual Studio Code. This is free. That's first and foremost. It's free. And also, download for Windows, sure. But this new editor... I know I, I, I'm taking now a, a pretty bold statement, but I would say that probably Visual Studio Code is probably one of the best tools Microsoft ever shipped. Uh, I know that I, I know that probably not all of us like who are, who are watching like IT pros and, and watching it, uh, using it right now, because especially because it says Visual Studio is usually kind of feels like a death thing, but it's it's. I, it made so my life so much easier, especially if you're working with multiple things, right? So you're not just working with PowerShell, but you're working, for example, as you said, like with JSON, and you need to have like a, the, there are plugins or extensions which help you to write JSON. Then, for example, now we we come up with Azure, like with the Bicep language, um, which basically helps you to write ARM templates. So we have an extension for that, and then obviously for all the third parties, I know that. Google and others have like the, the, I think the possibilities are like endless with these extensions. So um, like if you haven't done it, please do it. I know it gets kind of like used to it, and you can there is like some uh, PowerShell features, and there's a, a I think it's a PowerShell Easy mode where you can turn on and it looks like Easy. It looks like the same thing. It behaves the same way. So it's 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 pretty cool. Um, I think I have a blog post on that actually. Hmm. I'm not 100 percent sure, but I think there's a blog post. So, yeah. Let you. It, it works on Mac. It works on Linux. Works on Windows. So it's cross-platform. Well, that works really well for us. So we've been creating features in this editor for you. But we also realize that this is might be new to a lot of people. So let me just show you how to get started with this. Once you've downloaded VS Code, you can launch VS Code. I've got the icon right here, and I'm going to launch it. And I already have a script in here because we're going to take a look at some crazy things that we can do with VS Code in here. But I want you to notice this is kind of confusing at first. It's got all of these icons down the left. There's one icon on the left I want to start with. Yep. When you get VS Code, what you really need is the PowerShell extension for VS Code. That's what gives you all the PowerShell goodness. So when you go to extensions over here, now I already have it in mine, but... Up here in the search box, if you type PowerShell, you're actually going to see a lot of things for PowerShell. But what I want you to notice is the one that I already have, the PowerShell extension here at the top. Please, please show easy mode. Please, Jason, do me a favor. Huh? Yep. And also, if you want to be on the bleeding edge with us in some of the latest development that we're doing, you can get the PowerShell preview, and that'll have the latest and the greatest in it. Once you install this plugin, now you can start working on your scripts just like you did. Oh, did I say just like you did with the ISC shame? Really? Just like yeah. I did? Yeah, I know. This is this is where let me get rid of this and just kind of show you. I've got a script in here. Here's one of the benefits the extension has added. I think this is great. So if you are new to VS Code and you're like, wow, this is throwing me off. Go up to view. Or, or you just can't see it in the recording. You got that terrible dark mode. It's like, I, I can't. I, keep I know. It's in my eyes. <laughs> I, I really love that Joey is pointing out uh, the dark mode. Um, so for, for everyone, like if you do presentations, and I know this, Jason did this on purpose because he wants to show off, um, obviously, the PowerShell um, mode uh, or the easy mode. Um, so if you do presentations and edit it, please, please, for the love of God, just 
use a light theme. So it's way easier for everyone to see. But this is not going to be awesome. So you have to watch this. And I know he did it on purpose. So just, just watch it. It's At terrible least, dark yeah. mode. It's, yeah. So here's the thing. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go up to the command palette and I'm going to type the word ISE. What you're going to see here is you're going to see enable and disable ISE mode. So if you're coming from the ISE and you want to make your life easier, click enable ISE mode. It'll take it a second. And lo and behold, as it's doing it, you'll see it's flipping it. It's changing the colors. It's making it just the way that I, as an ISE user, would expect it to be. Now, First time I saw this, I'm like, it's not, by the way, it's not just the design, right? I mean, the design we had, I think we had PowerShell theme before, but I think, I'm sure Jason will drill into this, but there's a couple of things which also change from a behavior. Um, so you can actually run it the same way as you would have like just wrote your script before. Oh, here's the cool part. This is PowerShell, not that, uh, not the, older Windows, this is the new PowerShell. So of course, if I go over to my Linux box, bring up VS Code, running the same script, and I go out to view, command palette, and I say, you know what, I really want this in ISE mode, it's gonna do exactly the same thing on my Mac. So I get beautiful looking ISE in that color form. And hey, you might decide, uh, you know what, I wanna use, I wanna go back to the original VS Code. You can just click and go right back to VS Code style. Uh, I'm gonna close the one additional window. So whatever makes you happiest, the important part here is start using VS Code. This is where we're putting all of the new features, all of the things that you need that you're asking for, like all the Git support and JSON support, it's here. So come here and get it. We've tried to make it easy for you to be able to get started with it. Pierre, is that kind of cool? Yeah, that, that's very cool because I, I have to admit that I've, I've spent an awful lot of time uh, in the uh, editor, uh, mostly when I'm like troubleshooting so I can just like highlight a few lines and say just run those selected lines and see what the result is and then run the next and, and, and insert like breakpoints and try to figure out where my script is actually going wrong. Um, but I can do this. Uh, I can see myself doing this in the, in the VS Code instead. Well, you know what? I'm so glad that you just brought that up, as a matter of fact. Um, Almost like it was planned. No, no, no. You know, I... That smile means it was planned. <laughs> hey, I'm so glad you brought it up about debugging and all of that, as a matter of fact. Yeah. It's like it was planned. This is awesome. Um, I'm just, uh, uh, let me grab this script uh, again really quick. Because I wanted to show you a couple of other things here about VS Code. So I've got this script up. Now, I want you to take a notice about some things. We're going to go to great extents to try to help you. We have something called the PowerShell Script Analyzer. And with VS Code and the PowerShell Script Analyzer, we're going to help you with some of the editing and some of the best practices to make sure that you're writing some pretty good code that's easier to maintain. I want you to notice these little kind of yellow squigglies. I know it's hard to see, but they're squigglies underneath some of these. I've got this dollar sign A, and as I, I go up here and I hover over, it's saying variable A is assigned, but it's never used. This comes from the PowerShell script analyzer, giving me a warning that I've created a variable, but you're not using it. Here's the other interesting thing. If you kind of move your mouse down, you can peek into this problem and it'll give you a more description. You can even get some documentation on this. So I can, you know, go, oh, I need to use this variable. So I'm gonna say, okay, just write um, output dollar sign A. I, I, why did I use it if I didn't wanna put it out? So you notice, okay, script analyzer says, awesome. Thank you for fixing that. But I've got something else problem here. When you write scripts, it's not, a, it's not the best practice to use aliases. And on Windows, ls is, a, is an alias. It's yep. an alias for get child item. As a matter of fact, it's telling me, don't use the alias, use get child item. I can peek the problem. It'll give me that, 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 that information. However, here's the interesting thing. When I go back here, I can not only peek into that problem, but I can go to quick fix. Quick fix will give me the option of automatically... Well, I think if I click on it here, I gotta get my mouse over. Oh, oh, oh I missed it. Wait a second, let me do it one more time. 
going to give me the option to, yeah, I'll fix it. I'll just replace that alias with the commandlet that it's po that, that alias points to, which is get child on him. Or I can show you that documentation and, and give you some documentation on avoiding, on why you should avoid aliases to begin with. Yeah, because so, that... I, I, when I see this, and it remind me, my, remind myself of the times where I was uh, uh, writing PowerShell, lots of PowerShell scripts. Like I think again, it was PowerShell version two, and and, and version three just came out a little bit later. Um, I wish I would have that tool. Like, the, like the predictions, the variables. Like you cannot imagine. Like I think I used the third party tool back in the days where you were able to see what's in the variable during like a debug runtime and stuff like that because i think I, the powershell easy couldn't do that at the beginning and uh, pff, like these predictions and stuff it's just uh, i wish I, I had that before and there might be a very specific reason why i want to use this yeah you know what you know what as a matter of fact i give you a great example um there might be a reason that you want to use this, so you don't have to follow the rule, but yep. you can, you know, certainly continue on. We've got a lot of rules to help you, though, with best practices. Like, notice I'm... Pierre is uh, kind of like a rule breaker here. So he's like, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use aliases in my scripts. That's that's what I'm going to do. Taking the function over here. Oops. Uh, and I gave the function a name. Well, PowerShell expects that you have approved verbs for the name, gimme is not an approved verb. So that's what it's actually going to tell me is that uh, this is using an unapproved verb. Um, so you can see how beneficial this is. I'm going to go down to another one here. Here I've created a parameter and I, because I want to use this password and I've set up a string as a password and it's warning me, giving me a security warning. Don't do this. You want to use secure strings so that you don't expose this in plain text. Okay, maybe this, I should have a warning on this and said like, uh, uh, and hard coding passwords in any scripts is not condoned by this uh, by this panel. <laughs> uh, I, I I I mean, this is also not especially if you're learning. I mean, it's great if you're looking at something and this helps you to find the right stuff. If you're even an experienced like PowerShell scripter. But if you're getting started writing PowerShell scripts, this is basically gives you all the best or almost all the best practices of like what to do and what not to do. Um, so I, I think that is that is pretty awesome. Like I, again, like I mean, how many times you need to figure out that you, for example, should not like. I remember when I started reading PowerShell scripts, I, I I did not know that there were like verbs which you should use and which you shouldn't use. Um, and so like I remember when I figured it out, I was like, oh, holy crap, that. I should change that um, behavior. And so with that, also with the passwords, I mean, this is, uh, I cannot imagine again. Like, I would have loved that earlier, but now so jealous, so jealous. Absolutely. But that's really what the idea here is. You're using VS Code, you get all of this stuff for free. Plus you had mentioned, you know, setting breakpoints and debugging. We can do all of that. Take a look at this yep. for each loop that I have here. Um, I'm going to have this loop iterate and just show the numbers one through 50. Matter of fact, I'll run it for you real quick so you can see it. And I'm going to hit F8 just to run what I have selected on the screen. And you can see down here in the terminal, it's running through those numbers one through 50. Well, let's pretend for a second that I was confused and I'm not too sure what, 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 what this variable dollar sign I is getting set to. Well, you can go in, that's the wrong line, and you can set a breakpoint. Let me show you what a breakpoint is. This is where the program execution is going to stop. So I've set this breakpoint. Now I'm going to run the script. Mm -hmm. And you're going to notice a couple of things. If it doesn't auto pop out, over here, there's some debug information. Now, what I'd like you to notice is I set this breakpoint on dollar sign $i because I want to inspect this. I want to see what's going yep. on. One of the things you'll notice is right there's dollar sign i, and it's telling me right now it's a value of one. I can also go down here in the terminal and say, hey, what is dollar sign i? It's a one. Now, so if you have ever written a lot of PowerShell scripts with variables and stuff like that, where you had like for each loops and stuff, and you needed to like troubleshoot and see if it's working or you needed to write these, 
Ah, oh, this is this is this is gold. So um, again, very important. <laughs> I cannot imagine. Like I remember years ago and fighting with this, and and now, uh, well, this already exists for a little bit of time. So, but yeah, I'm still blown away by by that. As I'm in debug mode, and there are some key combinations that you can look up, like C to continue. In other words, it's going to continue and go through this loop again. Yep. So I'm going to have it continue, and I'm going to check dollar sign I. You can see in the left pane. It's changed to two. If I hit continue again, it's going to change to three. It's going to keep doing that all the way through 50. But I want you to notice kind of a, a line of code I have in here. Hey, if I got an if statement in here, if this is greater than 50, then write output, I'm over 50. That's what PowerShell tells me every morning when I sit down anyways. So uh, the, in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, what's dollar sign I right now? It's set to three. Actually, I want to see if that if statement works. So dollar sign I equals 51. And now I'm going to continue. And boom, you can see that if statement worked. It says, yeah, that's over 50 and goes right back in. The moral of the story here, I think, you know, Roman, is that, you know, the features that you were used to in the ISC, like debugging that, have gotten better in VS Code. And now that VS Code offers you the ability to basically look like the ISC, but still get all of those features, we want you to go out and grab VS Code instead of the ISC, use that, flip it into ISC mode if you want, but make sure you're using this, that way you can get all of the new features that we have. That's perfect. Makes sense? Yeah, oh, it makes cool. absolute sense. Plus, yeah. I can use it everywhere, and I don't have to worry about do I have ISC installed? Do I like? It's great. I mean, I mean, not just the debugging stuff, but also the, all the other stuff which is coming with it. I mean, debugging stuff is clearly like the most awesome part, like to like the, the advanced stuff. But then also like the integration, for example, with Git, like that you can just do commits and, and stuff like that. And and I think that is that is also um, very valuable. And very often you also not like just need to write PowerShell, right? You sometimes have like XML files, JSON files, and so on, YAML files you need to deal with. And I think if you can use the same editor for that and do all the work in one place, yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, I, I, I personally, a uh, big, big fan of VS Code simply because of all of the things that, that, that you don't just write PowerShell scripts anymore. A lot of us working in DevOps and all that have different languages, need to work with JSON, makes a lot of sense. Yep. Here, there was one other thing I wanted to bring up, and this is one of those secret things that you didn't let out of the bag yet that is a, a recent preview release for us. And I'm very very excited. Now, this is early days, okay? What that means is we still have work to do, but I want to give you an idea here. Pierre, how many times have you run IP config? Check your IP address. Uh, too many times to remember. That's right. We've all done that. This is, now I'm going to define One the One of term. the first commands I ever learned. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> Even worse is is running that command and trying to capture the output so I can parse it and find like one little piece of. I think it was also like one. I'm pretty sure it was maybe my first command too because I think, like especially then with like flush DNS, <laughs> I think that that was uh, definitely the one I I would have used. Useful information. Yeah, you know what? As a matter of fact, I so. You probably did the same thing that I did. You can see it up here, right? I want to do select IPv4 address, and that's just not going to work. Um, yeah. because, and here's the reason why. First of all, let's define this. The command that I'm running, ipconfig, I refer to as a native command. Here's what a negative native command is. You might think of it as, well, those are those old commands. Okay, some of them are, but they're also brand new native commands like kubectl and docker these are amazing commands that are very powerful so we've got some of these older ones that are still really useful and we've got newer ones and since powershell's cross-platform we've got native commands both in windows like ip config and then on linux like if config so how do we make these native commands easier to work with in powershell well, if you've been working with PowerShell for a while, let me just say, if you there, you can today write a PowerShell. I'm just going to tell you, it, 
now gets super interesting. I don't know where he is going. I haven't seen the video before. I haven't heard about what the feature is. Um, but I know this this is going to be interesting. Shell script that wraps a native command and it makes it look and feel more like PowerShell. And, however, that requires a pretty unique skill set. A matter of fact, if you have that skill set, you might look to see if that native command is a, uses a REST API and just use auto REST to wrap it. So there are a lot of ways that you can do what I'm about to show you if you have a more developed, a developer oriented skill set and are comfortable doing that. But what if you don't have that skill set? I don't have that skill set. Well, I do a little bit, but what if you don't I have don't, that skill set? I don't, so show me. Right. So <laughs> here's the thing IP config. Yep. Wouldn't this be cool? IP config. Thanks, predictor. That works. It's, it's a okay. verb, it's a noun. I can use it in a pipeline, which means this command is producing objects. Joey started this off by talking about how important objects were. Objects so that I could use it. Yep. I said so at the beginning. Objects, one of the most awesome things in PowerShell. Told you. Down a pipeline with other PowerShell commands. Because I'm using a verb noun name, I can be consistent. It looks like a PowerShell command. And of course, if I do get help on it, there'll be some help there. So oh, is it like things? every command? Well, so if I do like da thing. get dash dir for a directory listing. In fact, let me show you how you get this, right? This is going to require some work on your part because I don't know what native commands you're interested in, but you know what native commands you're interested in. So let me show you how to do this. First of all, well, just quite honestly, I just need to show you this right now. Well, I'll show you this in a second. So I'm going to show you <laughs> what, uh, where am I uh, demo? Let's do this. Let's go. Uh, what did I? Oh, actually, that's what I wanted. That's what I wanted. So here's what I want to do is show you. We're going to give you some links for this, but we have a module. You can go out to the gallery, type in the yep. word crescendo, and you're going to find PowerShell crescendo. What this module does is that it allows you to create or author commandlets out of native commands. So you decide what command you want, and then you can author it. And we're, we're trying to make this to be a much easier authoring experience. Let me give you a quick example. So I've got something, I've got a JSON file here. Yep. This JSON file is how I'm gonna turn the native command ipconfig into a more PowerShell-like usable command for me and automation that I wanna set up that's all I need. So I'm going to do code. And let me show you what this looks like. Oh, and for some reason, my code got so much smaller all of a sudden. I'll make it bigger here as soon as it pops up. Come on. Let me have my screen back. There we go. Let's make this a little bit bigger. So right now, we have a JSON file. And let me show you how this works. There we go. JSON. So you need to have a JSON file. Now we're going to auto generate. I just want to say before he says, nothing ever comes good when you have a JSON file. <laughs> no, just kidding. Template for this for you. But the JSON okay. files are very simple. They're property and values. So this comes with a schema. The schema is going to help you to make sure that you're typing in the right things. When I want to set up a native command, first of all, I decide what verb and noun it gets. So here I typed in get, and I decided I'm going to call it ipconfig. The next thing I do is I give it what is the native command. So give me the location to that native command. And if you want to start putting in some help description, you can. Then you need to help me understand, the JSON file needs to understand what the parameters are going to be. Now you get to decide how much of this native command you want to deal with right now. Now, ipconfig, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but ipconfig actually has a ton of switch options. Now, the only ones I've ever right. used are release and renew, but <laughs> it's got other switch options. Uh, flush DNS. Am I the only one? Like, I can't be the only one. Like, ipconfig slash flush DNS. Like, please, in the chat, tell me. Use that too. 
Here's the flush DNS. Flush DNS. Flush DNS. Flush DNS. Thank you. Because it's always the end. Yeah, I don't have to sit down and go, oh, I got to handle all these switch parameters at once. No, nope. you only have to deal with the ones you want to deal with right at this moment. The only ones I wanted to deal with right now in this get of IP config was slash all and all compartments. That's it. So I created those. You put in the original parameter. You put in what you want the parameter name to be on this new command line. Now, the tricky part, and this is the part that we're working on, is then you can turn it into an object. Now, right now, this looks pretty scary for IP config. We're working on improving this. This is an output handler that will take all of that string data that comes from the native command, under try to understand it and figure it out, and then put it onto an object that can move down the pipeline. So Crescendo is going to allow you to wrap the native command within minutes and then pop out objects from it. So when you want to build this, take this JSON and turn it into something that you can use. As soon as I can get there, we go. Here's what's going to happen. We have a command let export. Oh, thank you, Predictor. I didn't want to type all this in. Just so happens that I have three <laughs> JSON files. Some It lets me get the IP. It lets me uh, release and renew the IP in each one of these JSON files. What I'd like to do is just export this to a PowerShell module. So in my case, thanks, Predictor, I'm going to export this to ipconfig.psm1. Now, that module already exists on my system. That's why I'm getting the error message. But at that point, all you need to do is import that module. I'm going to show that to you in just a second. But let me give you this. Here's the module that it was made. Now, yep. what's inside of that module? What did Crescendo do for me? Here's what Crescendo did for me. I'm going to show you what's in that module. Not everybody has seen this, but what Crescendo does is it takes that JSON file and it builds proxy commandlets into this module for you. Here's the beautiful thing of this module and these proxy commandlets. You didn't have to write any of that code. It was all no. for free. All you need to do is import the module. Now you can use it. But here's the beautiful part. I'm going to go over to Windows PowerShell, and uh, let me see here. I've got um, uh, CD uh, IP. Can go in there. Is that right? Uh, I have that generated module. The module that I generated in PowerShell 7. OK. That, that, is, that is pretty cool. I, I just realized like that's just why he didn't want to show it before. It was like it's something you do with PowerShell Seven. You generate that module, like writing that code. I mean, that's that's pretty sick because I think that that makes life a lot easier, especially if you're an admin. Like if you have some tools, some XE files, whatever, and you, you generate that. And now you can basically go and Im I, I'm sure like he will go and import that now and, and run it on on Power Windows PowerShell. So basically, you can run it on any system. I've got sitting right here. Let's see what happens. Import module. Thank you, Victor. Get. And it works. In other words, the point here, Backward the modules compatible. that get generated work down level to Windows PowerShell 5.1. The reason is, is that, think about this. The reason we're doing this is so that you can make native commands more PowerShell-like so you can use them in your automation. Yep. Well, I want to automate stuff across, whether it be on-prem or in the cloud. I want to automate across my systems. I can get a module to them. I can deploy a module. This will now give me the ability to write that automation and use that automation the way that I, as a PowerShell user, am more comfortable with. So, and, and oh, hey, this all works cross-platform. Now, in this case, IP config does not work on a Linux box, okay? That's only yep. Windows, but I've got a couple over here for you. Hey, if you're a Linux person, you use who, and so I've got one wrap for who, and I don't know, I wrap one for LS. By the way, when you go out to uh, the PS Gallery and you download the Crescendo module, these samples of both Linux and Windows are already in there to help get you started. Okay. We got a blog post on the announcement to help get you started as well. I'm sure they did the easy ones, so <laughs> so you can you can go out and do the hard ones now.
But actually, it would be interesting if if they then also think that like if I create one, like let's say I have an XE val I like I, I want to have a PowerShell commandlet for, and I want to like that have that object oriented power. Um, if I then can go and basically just put that also in a gallery, in theory, I could, right? Because that was so, going to be my next sure. question: is is how is there some templates I can start using? But if the samples were already pre-installed or pre uh, yeah. included in the module then that's perfect. You betcha. And we'll get you started with our announcement blog that, of course, Pierre, we're going to give you the links to when we're all done here. So that getting the module, getting started with the module, getting set up for the first time, we're going to help you with that. Um, early days, and we still have a lot of work to do, but we encourage you to come out to the GitHub uh, repo uh, for Crescendo, which, again, we're going to give you the links to, and talk to us, discuss with us, file issues on us, let us Pierre. Seriously, doing this and then no links underneath you. That only works if you were like, have it in the description there. <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm actually blown away. And now I'm, I'm almost like, okay, let's, let's end this so I can go and load those modules and start <laughs> playing with this. But I want to continue this conversation because it's, it's blowing my mind. Uh, I was expecting, like, okay, I understand PowerShell, and like, we'll deep dive into like the PowerShell seven, the differences, and how we go from one to the other. But like, though, uh, you're you've surprised me. I'm not easily huh? surprised normally, so this is good. He is not easily surprised, really, Pierre. Really. Thank. I'm 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 enjoying that, and what I'm hoping is is that. You and all your friends, because I'm kind of surprised too. And this is really cool stuff. And some people that are still using Windows PowerShell 5 one, they're missing some of these, they're missing these great benefits. Yeah. Um, so yeah, tell your friends. And if this is doesn't matter if you're uh, as you mentioned, if, if you're an experienced PowerShell script writer uh, or user, or if you're just brand new to it, you, you every level of uh, a user or power user is gonna benefit. From those uh, those enhancement into the into PowerShell. Yeah, absolutely. yeah. And one of the one of the things I want to point out here, actually, specifically in that regard, is that you know I, I think one of the important parts about decoupling the generation of these these uh, crescendo modules yep. from the actual execution of them is that uh, users can and and we we hope and expect for folks to build open source crescendo modules around these these schemas. Right, and and the schema is basically just a mapping file. Your your whole or your source code is just the schema file, and then uh, you know your CI/CD pipeline is to run the crescendo to generate it and publish it to the gallery. So the hope is that for that super long tail of random switches on something like ipconfig or you know I think one of the ones I expect some folks to go in pretty hard on uh, immediately is Robocopy. Um, yeah, right. yes. and it's you know it's seventy five so switches or whatever. Uh, yeah. So, you know, like like if those are managed in the community, we can really get a collaborative effort going where folks can all, you know, contribute pull requests that add support for the switches that they care about. So, yeah, I think that is that is that's exactly what I meant. Like, so it actually is supposed to be that it's not just for you on your machine or in your company. It's really something like you can go out and create and then push it to a Git repo and then work together on it. And again, as you said, like look for on Robocop, we have so many switches, we can definitely use the manpower, everyone from the community to, to, to build these things. So uh, that is pretty cool. So that one day, you know, we can have uh, a much greater PowerShell coverage of a lot of these things, um, you know, in, in that sort of distributed nature of leveraging, you know, all the brilliant folks in the PowerShell ecosystem. So um, please do that. And sometimes you're you're looking at uh, uh, code, and you need to do something that you think is very niche and that nobody else is going to need. Right. And when you realize that you start searching online and you get some articles on like Stack Overflow or elsewhere, where you're not the only one. There's like a hundred people that are waiting for somebody to come up with something like that because they want to leverage it. Rarely, uh, maybe never. Have, have I been the first person to try something? And I think even for new features that we ship, in many, many cases, people have built hacks or workarounds to get to that point. And we're just taking that idea and, you know, first partying it uh, straight into the engine in sort of a more native way. But yeah, it's, you know, the, the, the PowerShell ecosystem is so massive at this point. There's nothing. 
just is there a like a vacuum cleaner somewhere in the background like okay but i i so just going back to that but this is really awesome i i mean think about all the new command lets we will soon have like based on some exe files or also linux tools right around linux tools as well so that is going to be awesome and especially if then they get the power like that was like the main reason why like, often you did not like have all the powershell commandlets and you needed Build something around it with an XC file. You did not get all the object-oriented things, and you ended up doing a lot of work. I mean, this this will definitely help us. Um, like, will help the community a lot. Like, if we have then more commands or commandlets available, basically, or more modules available for different things. There's nothing totally brand new out there. So, you know, no. leverage your peers, leverage the community, and 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 give back. Absolutely, and that that way you don't have to like build something that's held together with bubble gum and duct tape. Exactly. All right. Cool. So where are we at now? I think we've got one more set. We're gonna get through this here. Uh, you know, not that this is uh, painful or anything. I mean, I think we're just talking about awesome PowerShell goodness. So uh, it's, been, it's been very fun. But we've got uh, one more demo here uh, from yours truly on secret management. Um, I am filling in here for Sydney Smith, who's the PM on Secret Management and Secret okay. Store Modules. Um, but we're just going to show a brief, brief demo here. Um, so Secret Management uh, is basically, to, to give a quick description, it's a universal abstraction layer uh, for the management of secrets uh, in arbitrary secret vaults. Right. So what do we mean by this? Um, today, when you want to leverage a secret inside of your uh, your script, you need to do some custom handling. You're either um, using certificates in conjunction with CLI XML, or you're using some sort of uh, you know custom solution in your CICD pipeline. Maybe you're leveraging something like Azure Key Vault. Maybe you're using uh, you know Kubernetes to, to store your secrets. There's there's a number of different ways you can use HashiCorp's Vault that you could you know store these secrets and ultimately retrieve them in an automated fashion in, in a safe and secure way. But what that means is that when you actually build out a script that needs that secret, you need to hard code the logic of how to retrieve that secret directly into the script based on the secret solution that you're using to store that secret, mm -hmm. right? So what we've done here is we've built an interface, a pluggable interface that leverages commands like get secret vault, get secret info, set and get secret, um, as a way to allow you to write generic modules and scripts that work across arbitrary vaults. And then you simply configure your machine ahead of time uh, in sort of a pre-step to you know, register the correct uh, secret vault extension and then to register the secret vault that already exists. You know, this, is, this is not a solution for creating secret vaults or for, you know, you're not instantiating an Azure key vault here, but you register an exi existing Azure key vault and you simply say, hey, this is the secret I want to use. This could be parameterized. Yep. You know, that secret right there is the one I want to use on my machine. And then I want to run this generic get secret code, uh, you know, where that secret gets leveraged in, in some other sort of module, right? And so this allows for more genericization. Oop, I lost my little, uh, ah, lost my guy here. Oh. Um, you know, you can genericize modules that need secrets without necessarily hard coding them to a specific uh, uh, secret, right? So okay. if, if it turns out you want to use your local credential store instead of Azure Key Vault, you can still run that module on the gallery that, that is, uh, you know, meeting some sort of... By the way, really appreciate the effort that he has there, a IT Ops Talks 2029 folder. So just say, great work. Secure secret store in order to, to work. So I won't run all of the commands here because some of these are, are just intended to, to demonstrate here. I, you know, for instance, install module. Um, this is how I actually get the secret store module. Um, this will install secret management separately as a dependency, um, as secret store is dependent on secret management. Um, I'll talk briefly about secret store. This is essentially a vault extension um, that has been written by us um, and will be supported by us when this goes GA. Um, and it's a local secret store that works cross-platform using .NET in order to securely store uh, uh, any secrets that you may have on that one local machine, right? So this might not be what you want to use in your CICD pipeline because it's leveraged more for interactive usage, but 
um, you know, when you're when you're using your local box, you know, it's going to prompt you for a password. It's very similar to any other local password manager, uh, but it does work across Windows, Mac, and Linux, and it's fully integrated uh, with Secret Manager. So once I've got these installed, go ahead, go ahead please. I was going to say anything that helps with uh, pulling hard-coded credentials out of scripts and, and config files uh, is a good thing. Yes, mm -hmm. I, I would definitely agree with you there. Um, we're going to switch over to this light thing here just to make sure. <laughs> I, I mean, Pierre absolutely raised here a fantastic point, right? I mean, <laughs> we have, I know that we in engineering, we have like checks in place that we make sure that we do not have any credentials in our repositories anywhere, right? And I, I, I mean, if you want to have your scripts and write scripts, um, please, like, don't do that. Like, don't, like, uh, again, there are better ways of doing that. Um, but again, it's it's it may, you make it the attackers very easy if you have passwords anywhere in plain text. Um, that's going to be <laughs> uh, very tough. So, yeah, we're fully visible. But as you can see, um, let me make my font just one bigger. Um, we went ahead and ran get module microsoft.powershell.secretstar dash list available, and you can see. Um, that did not want me to set the theme. I don't know. No, everything got smaller, and then it went back to dark. Um, <laughs> That's okay. Uh, we'll just do one more. It does it again. Thank more. you. Okay. So, uh, so here we can see there are no secret vaults uh, currently registered. Um, so we're going to go ahead and create a new one here. Um, I am going to run one extra command here, which is to reset secret vault. Um, this is just going to make sure that my reset... Support, excuse me. That's why we need Oh, um, what this is going to do is just make sure that I have uh, a password. This is like the passphrase that I use for unlocking my uh, my secret store. You definitely shouldn't use this one. I'm going to use password one two three. And password one two three. I'll do that. Um, we can. Yeah, not a great password. I agree. <laughs> This secret vault, so we're going to use the, the module name here refers to the vault extension, which is secret store. Um, and then the, uh, as you can see, oh, so these are all the commands that are available in secret management, right? So, so we have the ability to register and register secret vaults, um, get set and remove secrets, uh, you know, get the info on secrets, et cetera. So we're going to go ahead and make one because right now we haven't done secret vaults as we showed earlier. Yep. And now you can see that we have a secret vault. That's awesome. There's the secret store. Uh, and you can see we have no secrets installed on the thing. Okay. Let's go ahead and create one. So we're going to just use the set secret here uh, and create a, mod, uh, a secret called foo. And that's going to prompt us at the command line. This is going to ensure um, using uh, uh, you know, secure input here that we're not logging this password to the uh, the transcript or the, the history that Jason was referring to in PS read line. Because we don't want those credentials stored persistently in plain text. That's the whole point of secret management. Um, and so here it's asking for a secure string secret. I'm going to go ahead and put in this is super secret. And that's going to get stored there. All right. So now if we run get secret info. Yeah, that's a good point. Like I also like you don't want to, especially with tools like the history and now the predictions, all of that. You, I'm sure you don't want to have like any passwords. Um, it, uh, plain text somewhere in the command that then it shows up for later use, right? We will see we have a secret called foo of type secure string. Uh, we can get the secret, but that is going to return the type as uh, secure string. So we don't want, uh, you know, to be displaying this right into the terminal again so it's not logged into the transcript. Um, but, you know, we can leverage this secure string in a bunch of commandlets provided that they're properly configured uh, you know, to take secure string input. But let's say that you're using a native tool like kubectl, and maybe it hasn't been wrapped by Crescendo yet, and you want to be able to, uh, you know, pass this input into a parameter invocation. Right? So I've got something like uh, 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 and it's got a uh, name uh, for a password or something like that. I can then put it in there. You can see on Pierre's face there that something with the audio isn't it good. You can you can see it. <laughs> Get secret who has plain text. <laughs> and so that uh, is a safe way to pass it directly to that 
uh, net native executable, um, and we'll show what that resolves to here, and you'll see, you know, if you do know what you're doing, I um, mean, you're okay with this because this isn't a real secret. It's fine. Um, you'll see I get the plain text version. This is super secret. All right, so that's a little helpful. And, um, and you can do this to the locals, the the uh, a local uh, secure store, and you can target uh, Azure Vault uh, or any other like. Um, like secret repository, really? Yes, yes. So I'm actually going to show right here. This is just a very, very briefly um, the the timeout information here. So this just says, "Hey, we can configure secret store." Um, it's got a, a password timeout. It's going to prompt for that passphrase we used before. Um, we can set that to zero, which basically means I'm going to get prompted every time I try to retrieve a secret. So if we run into secret foo. You know, it's going to say, hey, you, know, you need to have the one, two, three in there, and then we'll return that. Um, you know, then it'll ask for that every single time. But if we set, you know, the CPU store configuration to a top of 1,000, and we okay, need to give it once, and then for a 1,000 seconds, uh, it will just continue to work. Right? Okay. Um, so similarly, this inter Yeah. Audio is not that good in that part. Um, so let's see if hopefully, hopefully it gets better. But we are anyway almost at the end. And I really want to have Pierre in there. What do you think? Should we get Pierre into the live stream and um, uh, discuss quickly a little bit what he thinks and why he is looking so serious uh, in the video? Um, so please let let me know in the in the chat. But let's see what what else comes up. I just saw that there's some sort of power, uh, Azure window as well. So let's see. Interaction none means it will not allow me to do it at all unless I manually run this unlock secret store. Um, but we can always put ourselves back to the default. So um, what you're discussing is, hey, what about another vault extension? Yep, we've already got one of those. It's built for Azure Key Vault. Um, again, this is working already with Azure Key Vault 3.3.0. Um, you can see that we have that installed. Fantastic. Uh, and then we're going to go ahead and uh, set some variables here. Um, and we're going to register another uh, secret vault, which is already exists on the remote end. And you'll see we're passing this hash table of vault parameters. Right. Yep. So the Azure Key Vault vault name is that vault name we set. Subscription ID is subscription ID. Fantastic. We register that. That does not require internet access. Um, that hopefully just works here. This was something we were having a little bit of difficulty with earlier, but yes, great work. Um, I'm going to go ahead and connect up to Azure because retrieving those actual secret vault information and secrets themselves is going to require us to authenticate. Um, and so while that's happening, I'm going to pop over to the Azure portal where, where you'll see that we've already created this test vault um, in this, uh, this portal organization here. Um, this is the Azure Connect AZ account Manlet asking me for interactive inputs. So we're going to go ahead and let they log in. But you'll see we've got this test secret here, which means that when we go back to VS Code, we should be able to run get secret vault in order to see that, uh, okay, yeah, that's, that's AZKV. That's the one that we registered. It's not our default vault, so we will have to specify it uh, specially. So we specify it just like that, get secret info dash vault AZKV, and you'll see that that test secret exists right there. Right? So, uh, we can actually retrieve a test secret. We can do the same thing where we would have plain text. Sorry, that's a secret. Uh, and that is the name of the secret. You'll see that's actually going out to the internet to get Fubar Baz. Right? Similarly, I can create a secret. So we're going to create one called uh, using test secret called Fubar. And we're going to put in uh, thanks for a okay and then if we switch over back to our browser, you'll see that indeed we created a foobar of type secure string. Okay, that that uh, I think we get. I'm I'm not super over excited as I was before because I have seen that before. I mean, they announced the secret management for quite a while now, and so I, I played around a little bit with it. But I think that's really, really powerful. Um, they don't get enough credit for, for doing that, especially on a multi-platform environment. Um, and then this will make writing scripts and making sure that you can manage your secrets in a, in a secure way so much better. And I like the one where they have this key vault integration. Um, 
I need to try it out because I know that like um, Azure Arc enabled servers obviously gave you a managed identity of that server. And then you can actually go and leverage that to access, for example, Keyboard. And we have that in an order session, we, we show that. And so we could probably kind of like combine that so we can actually use the machine's identity to access Keyboard and then basically get like uh, the run the PowerShell script to actually get these these keys and store it and, and manage that and add those to the to the secret management. That would be a, a cool thing to do. So yeah. So for those, by the way, who have questions, um, I, 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 I forced Pierre on the stream. So we'll like as soon as we are done here, we'll, we will have Pierre on the stream. So please hold your questions. Uh, no, I've got my special master here turned on. Uh, uh, show secret value. Oh, thanks for a great talk. There it is. It, this, is this is fantastic. Um, I don't know how many times I've I've had to write, and in like fifty times in the script, I have to like stop and prop up that little message box. Is enter password here? Get credentials. Like because I'm accessing, but I don't want to store it anywhere, and I don't want right. to. So this now is you still you out. still will need to bootstrap your one credential in terms of connecting to Azure here, right? Yeah, so you but still once, need, but only once. Only and, once. Then, and that that is exactly what I just said. Like ex this is exactly the thing where where Azure Arc can come in handy, right? And you connect your machine using Azure Arc, and then you get that managed identity. Um, well. Again, you can also do it without Azure Arc, obviously, but this you, if you use Azure Arc, you even make that process easier and much more secure as well. So that's awesome. And you're good for the rest of your commandlet. And again, like it's modularizing that that uh, you know shareability of scripts and modules such that I can you know I, I can simply swap out my script that's getting and setting secrets, and I could you know put a parameterized value into that vault name. And I don't care about what kind of vault extension is being used. I don't care about whether it's over the wire on my local box. I could be going from a dev to a test to a prod environment. I could be doing multi-cloud. I could be going from on-prem to cloud. It doesn't matter. I'm always just running get, set, remove secret, and that's it. So this thing's going to GA hopefully within the next couple of months. We are going to be releasing a second release candidate very soon. Um, I want to just go over very, very quickly. I know we're, we're uh, burning up tons of time here, but we've just yeah, got one more slide or two more slides. This this is always the best part when like you do a presentation and then they, they get so excited that like, hey, I don't want to burn more time, but I have to show you this and I want to show that. So let's just demonstrate, hey, this is a ton of resources for you. All the repositories that we got with all these modules file issues, contribute to stuff, find us on Twitter, that PowerShell 7 module compatibility table, everything in Windows that works great with PowerShell 7. We've got community calls on the third Thursday of every month. Please join us on those. You can ask anything you want, uh, get the straight answer from the entire engineering team, um, install documents. I really will take advantage of those community calls. So definitely, so that was a super interesting session. I'm not gonna, we have. We will have the links obviously uh, in the description below that video, but also the original video and the original blog post. And then you can actually go out and test all these awesome things out. But I wanna now bring Pierre on the stream to actually see what he thinks about that session. So let's add Pierre. Hello, Mr. Pierre. How you doing? Good, Can good. You hear me awesome. Okay? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Right. Not as good as in the video, though, but but absolutely okay. <laughs> awesome session, by the way. Really, really glad. I, I was uh, blown away by by some of the stuff they showed, especially the prediction stuff for me was, and the history stuff was like, holy crap, that is awesome. Um, I know, and they had left. They had told me uh, a little bit earlier that they were going to. Uh, I'm just adjusting the sound here. Uh, that they were going to show me some stuff that was like unannounced or so we kind of had to keep it under. We, I would have loved to put that into into a tweet to say, hey, come and join us. We were going to talk about this new thing, but I like NDA. Um, so it was pretty cool. And, and 
this was supposed to be like a 45 minute session and then we just started to talk and go through some scenarios and oh watch me that and a lot of the times like i know you commented earlier that's that would have that by my the the smile on my face that the transition was planned and it was absolute that one was absolutely not planned nice nice it, it's just the 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 way that i was thinking about well, how can we do this? And what's the, the pain point where like, uh, I was asking questions based on like my interest in this and it just happened that it was his next point. So that was the next lead yeah. in. And it was just, yeah. we were laughing just because of that, but it was yeah. absolutely not planned. Yeah, no, I, it was great. I, I really loved the, the, the dynamics you had. Obviously it was very easy to watch. I was also like, before I, I, I started the record, like the video, the stream, I was not aware that it was like one hour and 20 something minutes. And I was like, holy crap, how do I get through this like in one stream? And I was like, yeah, I'll probably just move like at certain parts. Um, but it was so interesting um, uh, because they so, showed so many cool and interesting stuff. I mean, some of the stuff we already knew, but some of the stuff you always learn something new. Um, so that was that was really exciting. So I have to ask you, which which like, I mean, Obviously, you love all of the new features, but yeah. which, like the things they showed, what was the 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 ones you liked the most? Uh, I would have to say the uh, predictor and crescendo, and in that order. Okay. Uh, okay. The the predictor, especially when you can add plugins, which right now there aren't that many of them, but uh, they will come. And I, I saw your question earlier as to where does the plugin get its information, and I'm not quite sure where. Uh, I'd have to, I have not had time because uh, you and I have had uh, last week was kind of a busy week, uh, and this week I'm just kind of still recuperating. Uh, I have not had time to actually drill down to how you build a, a predictor plugin and where do you put put in the information. My guess is that it scrapes the docs.microsoft.com for the um, for the Azure commandlets uh, and then just kind of like massages it and, and puts it up for you. That's my guess. I'm not I'm not 100 yeah. percent sure. Uh, yeah, that would have been like that is kind of like the that was I thought. Like it's kind of like similar than with the AC uh, well the Azure CLI uh yeah. find one. But this this seems to be a much nicer integration because you don't need to run AC find something. You actually can just type and it predicts and that that is awesome. Like uh I did they mention I don't know, I I maybe I missed that, but I would also love obviously that this comes uh in the Visual Studio code. Uh, extension maybe as well, not just in the like, the one liner. Um, from what I understand, yeah. From what I understand, it's not in the Visual Studio Code. Uh, there is the IntelliSense uh, in Visual Studio Code that you can actually start typing, um, and it'll kind of autocomplete for you. Uh, this is strictly, I believe, uh, at this point in the um, in the shell. So the yeah, PowerShell the seven. Line, yeah where it actually rec recalls your history. So if you're in PowerShell, if you're in, in Azure, uh, Azure bleh, if you're in a uh, Visual Studio Code and you've got the terminal in, uh, opened at the bottom, then yes, it will show up in the terminal, but it's not going to show up in the editor. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, I... If I mean that would be that would be the next step. I mean, I guess it's again it's part of if I remember it correctly, they mentioned it's part of like the PS Suite line one, and uh, that's why I'm like asking. Like, I mean, to, in theory, they could probably also add that at one point, not like take the same code and maybe put it into the Visual Studio Code one, or maybe I missed something there. And PS Suite line is already somehow integrated into the extension, but yeah, that would definitely be also worth because I mean I, I often type like obviously in in the in, in Windows terminal for example or something like that but even more often I do it in Visual Studio code like especially if it's larger commands and I need to like copy paste and do stuff it's easier if you if you do it like in in, in a in an editor right so that is why I'm so interested on it yeah I I, I really like I, I have to agree like the the history and the prediction especially the prediction feature that is that is going to be gold. Uh, I really, really, uh, I mean, Jason, I think he mentioned it. He was like, yeah, I've used it for now a couple of weeks or something, um, and I cannot use it without it anymore, something like that. So I was like, yeah, can't imagine yeah, that this it, is going to happen. It's going to be big. I think it's going to be a, one of those features that everybody kind of gravitates towards. Um, 
But you mentioned something very important. If you're doing like user groups or meetups or Ignite uh, demos, you're going to want to uh, clear your history because. <laughs> yep. Uh, I mean, I mean, usually I don't have any like any any crazy stuff in there, right? But it's sometimes you probably add something which you don't want necessarily uh, everyone to to know, right? And then yeah. maybe you do like I don't even know, like maybe you do something like a. Well, I don't know if 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 they use the PS read line commands correctly. If you have all the commands, if they do the secure string stuff, then they should be probably not stored in the history. But still, it can still be that there will be at one point some sort of credential or anything. Um, like yeah, secure uh, secure strings are not uh, saved in your history. Yeah. So I mean, if if the commandlet is done nicely, it will not. It will. It will just like prompt you for a secure string. But if the command is not commandlet is not written very nicely and it just wants your plain enter plain text password, yeah. it can happen, right? That it gets in. Yeah. Um, yeah, but no, it's awesome. Like I really liked it. What was your take on the secrets management? Because that was like the last thing they basically talked about. Like I know this is not this was not I also for you it was not something we I mean it was released or announced um, I think a couple of months ago already. Yeah. But yeah, it, it's um, been announced, but it hasn't gone GA yet. Um, I think it will be a very powerful thing to add, especially when we're in an hybrid environment where you have passwords here, you have passwords there. Uh, hard coding passwords in anything is never, ever, ever a good idea. Um, yeah, mo mostly because it can be harvested, and we we internally for all of our GitHub repos, we actually have there's a process that runs every day uh, that scans all of the Microsoft repos for any type of credentials or or passwords and and, and things like that, and basically strips them. And yeah, yeah, I I just heard that this is also like coming to even like preview repositories and stuff just to make really really sure because sometimes it happens even even if you're not in the production repository you probably use the same by accident the same password and stuff like that and then things happen by the way I want to take advantage I just want to point out there's still Andrew is uh, one of the viewers who was like basically almost the whole video in it and he's still I, here I really want, yeah he's still here so <laughs> Andrew what do you what do you think by the way while uh, Pierre and I are chatting a little bit what was your favorite uh, feature or part or uh, trick or whatever you call it, call these things. So please, please feel free to to point it in chat. And also, everyone else who's still watching, please put it in the chat. I'm really happy to see what you think was was the best part. Except for Pierre Serious face, that was that was also one of my highlights. I, I actually, I'm going to cover that while we're waiting because there is a time delay before between the for the uh, the broadcast. Um, I got I started looking at the uh, my internet and trying to in the through the back channel to ask Joey to start closing application because it was only Joey's uh, voice or sound that started getting crackly and I knew that because we're all working from home now because it's 2021 and it's the year of the human malware um, uh, he had a construction crew in his house and just oh. before we started uh, uh, presenting, he went out of the room and gave them cash and say, hey, here's money. Go for lunch. I'm buying you lunch. And you got to be gone for, the, for, the, for an hour. And they all kind of went, all right, great. And they left. And then they came back. We weren't done. And that's when you started <laughs> hearing the vacuum in the back. It was nice. in his house. There was construction going on. <laughs> nice. Uh, I mean, that's still. I mean, I just heard it by very listening, very, very carefully. Right? It was not that it was like. I was more worried about his internet connection. That seemed to be a little bit like all the time when he was sharing his screen. We had like a couple of things, but yeah, but it worked out great. I mean, it still was absolutely usable. And again, I was super excited what what they had to show. So let me see. Andrew said, Pierre's question that viewers would be asking too. I like the fact that Pierre. Oh, so he liked he liked your part as kind of like as the interviewer who actually like asks the questions like what he actually wants, what the our viewers want to know. So good job there, as I said, as from my side. But uh, thank you very much, I guess, Andrew. Um, that is that's very nice feedback. You always yes, very nice. Try to that, make you. 
and you were part of those discussions when we decided uh, how we were going to make this uh, event um, based on the feedback of other uh, online events when you're presenting to a screen by yourself or presenting to a camera by yourself it doesn't have the same the same flow or the same like you're not really engaged because you're just basically going through the motion and and presenting to a camera but when there's somebody else there that stops you asks you questions redirect or oh i didn't really understand that part can you go over it again it becomes a conversation so it's like we're sitting at the bar with drinks and uh, you and I are having this, this conversation about PowerShell and the audience is sitting at the table with us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's more or less you have, you are at the bar um, speaking to the pro uh, program manager to Joey and Jason and I'm the awkward guy watching you now, what you're actually talking about, like sitting there on the table and looking at the bar and like try to figure out what they're talking about. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, but you're absolutely right. I mean, that is like great. And that's also where we are very happy obviously to like, I mean, where we have our audience, uh, if they ask questions, we obviously really try to get you answers and, and probably provide you with the information uh, you want to hear. Um, so. Hey. And if there are questions that haven't been answered either through the session or through this uh, this uh, webcast or stream, sorry, uh, webcast. I'm showing my age. But, uh, well, I was laughing because I I, I probably didn't a answer any questions. <laughs> so I just made fun more about uh, like whatever they should. Yeah. <laughs> but we still have the 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 Discord server. So for this particular session, HTTPS uh, slash uh, whack whack aka dot ms slash ops one seventeen dash chat, uh, which is uh, our. You're gonna write that down somewhere and put that as a banner or something. Uh, <laughs> There is a chat uh, a chat channel that Joey and Jason and their team are monitoring. So if there are any questions in there uh, that we didn't cover or that you want clarification on the specific point, you can still go there and, and ask your question uh, and they will answer it. If not, uh, I will ping them and say, hey, there's a question there, please answer it. Um, so that it's, it's part of the the online experience we wanted to generate. Yeah. No, I just put the the link to the to the Discord into uh, the chat. Something else uh, you also mentioned, and I think it was also at the end they showed. I mean, obviously we have all the links again. Put it in the description below and have a link all the videos. Uh, but what I want to show quickly is um, what they mentioned: the PowerShell community call. Yeah. Um, which is which is a community call where everyone can. Be part of, and actually, you can go in and 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 talk to the PMs and talk about what's coming. So it's a very open uh, development here, and you can also see that all all of the sessions are recorded. They have a transcript, so you can actually see see what's going on. So everything is basically done, or more or less, in the open, um, and and so people can see and give provide feedback as well. So if you are working with PowerShell. And um, want to give provide feedback. Obviously, you can go out to to the GitHub as well as obviously join these community calls. Yeah, and, and PowerShell is an open source uh, platform now, so it, we have to include the community. And with the with Crescendo in terms of creating commands or, or wrapping commands into commandlets, uh, if all of the community, like let's say you do. Uh, uh, IP config, well, which is already done, but not all of the the the, the, the commands or the, the 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 parameters have been uh, coded in. But if you're running on Linux and you want to do an IF config, or if you want to do a container with uh, with Docker commands or or Kubernetes with like uh, uh, cuddle control, um, like all of these can be wrapped into PowerShell and then run anywhere as part of your automation. And I love your idea of using the uh, managed identity of the VM. Uh, I'm, I'm not, I, I'd have to look into that because when you're running a uh, uh, through automation, it uses a service principle that's already got some access depending on how you've set it up. Uh, I don't know how you would 
tell your automation or you or if you're using PowerShell as part of a, a custom script extension, like how do you tell it which identity to assume to, to use the identity of the VM or to use the identity of the service principle uh, or that the that the module is running in? So if it's uh, Azure Scripts extension, it's running as a uh, the Azure service. So so yeah, that's actually a good 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 question because that was like something I tried to wrap my like again in the last couple of minutes when I looked at secret management, I suddenly tried to combine these two things. Uh, the way it is like when you have an Arc machine, the same as you would have when you have an Azure machine, uh, you have basically a local. API which you can connect to and you get your ID of the machine. So you can then, okay, well, if you write a script, you would just first go to that API, get your ID, and then with that ID, you can then go and, hey, um, Azure, I'm that specific server or that specific uh, part, and then actually uh, access, access uh, necessary resources. And again, obviously you need to then set the permissions on the Azure side, obviously, uh, that this machine then obviously has even access to whatever it should have access right yeah but um you get the you get the idea and so i think that is something i need to wrap my head around how this can be combined but this is definitely uh something which i'm, I'm very excited about that sounds like a wonderful blog post uh, <laughs> thomas yeah yeah absolutely I, I i first need to figure out how i'm going to do that but definitely is something by the way you also said you have a blog post in the making for the prediction stuff right <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, mostly not not about installing it because that's covered uh, through the, the, the existing documentation. But I took Joey's uh, our my con our conversation and like because I'm running it uh, on this machine right now, uh, but I have got another machine uh, in that's like my Hyper V box. I've got other servers running there that I test stuff on, and I've got uh, my Cloud Shell. Uh, and, and as I said in the meeting, my cloud shell, the way I run my cloud shell is not, is not, um, and of course I can't find it right now. Uh, I don't run it, I don't have PowerShell installed like the, or the, um, the cloud shell tools installed locally. Uh, what I do is I have, a, and I've put a blog article about that before, how I use um, Docker uh, container locally to run the cloud shell container. So every time I start it, it checks to see if there's an update. So I don't have to worry yep. about updating the modules, updating the tools, updating. It's always up to date because it's the same container that's running in the Azure portal. So if you do shell.azure.com, I'm just running this locally instead of going to the internet. So I don't have to worry about the 20 minute timeout. I don't have to worry about all these things. Yep. It's running locally. Yeah. Uh, so my PowerShell is basically that. I always um, run this. So because there's always updates, and I don't want to have to deal with this. Yeah. Did you nicely integrate it into Windows Terminal so that you can just open a new tab and it automatically starts the Docker container and everything? Or did you, uh, or did you not do that yet? I haven't done in the uh, Azure in, in the Windows Terminal. I have done it in uh, VS Code. So in VS Code, uh, when I start my VS Code, I connect to the container that's running yep. so that when I start a, a, uh, a terminal, the terminal in VS Code is actually okay. running inside the container. It's not running on my machine. OK. I know someone who wrote a very good blog post how you can customize these uh, <laughs> things and you can actually run the Docker container and then it opens the, directly the Docker container. Hmm. Uh, I'm not going to tell you who, but uh, he's probably in that call. So, <laughs> uh, but I know you have a like. I, I'm sure you mentioned it, um, but we should definitely also put that in the link. You, you that blog post on how you actually made that cloud shell container available. Um, to actually run that locally, right? I think that there's, there is something, some really useful tools. Also, by the way, Andrew, just ask, why are you doing that? Uh, is it uh, ease of use or what are what are the reasons uh, you're doing that? Uh, multiple reasons. Uh, one is I'm running uh, a desktop at my desk here. Uh, I have my Surface Book and I have my Surface Laptop 
Uh, and depending on where I am, I will take one or both or uh, all of those machines and work together. Uh, I'm running it also on, on other machines and in the cloud shell. Locally, uh, when I start in the script in the uh, in the blog post, you can read it. It's on itopstalks.com. Um, when I mount the container, it actually connects to a local drive on my machine, which is a cloned version of my repo. So all my scripts are there. Uh, so if I go from one machine to the other, I just re I just refresh, do a pull request, uh, uh, not a pull request, but I just pull the the, the repo back down to my machine. And then all my scripts are there. Uh, I don't have to worry about updating the tools. Uh, if I'm updating Python, if I'm updating uh, Azure CLI, if I'm updating PowerShell, the I've left it left it to the people who manage uh, the cloud shell, and they keep it up to date. So every every time when I start it, uh, it checks to see if there's a new version. If there's a new version, pulls it back down, and it runs it. If, if there's no uh, version it just runs it locally uh, just making things a little easier on myself especially across multiple machines so that if I and I know that if I build a demo based on that image and I run that demo on another machine uh, I'm using the same you know I don't want to end up with the it works on my machine at home kind, <laughs> yeah. of, kind of scenario so yeah. No, I'm that's pretty cool. I just, questions. Yeah, I just want to put like there was a, some talk about that um, how to make that available in terminal. So I quickly wanted to uh, quickly. Why does that not work? So I want to quickly put that this in the chat, but I, I don't have access with that machine. Why ever? I don't know. To be honest, well, we will figure it out. You can just find it on my blog um, or search for customized Windows terminal settings. I think then you can see there. There are a lot of different examples. Well, I actually what I can do is I can share quickly that, and I just want to quickly wrap this up. Um, but I want to show this quickly, um, and then we also like Pierre. If you want to quickly add your blog post as well, I, I think people would appreciate that. So one thing I did here. Uh, is a blog about how you customize your terminal settings. I mean, this goes about coloring and all, all stuff as well. But then also, um, again, I'm quickly going to go and scroll all the way down here. Or well, let me see if I can do it here. So you have different commands here uh, or different shells here. In this sense, it just opens an SSH connection um, to, for example, an Azure VM or whatever you want it to be. Um, in the drop down, and here, for example, it can run uh, directly a Docker container um, instead of, for example, um, uh, for example, running like PowerShell directly and something like that. So here, you could just basically create one of these profiles here within Windows Terminal, and then actually have that uh, as well. Yeah. So uh, I just put there. Uh, my article, which is uh, on uh, IT Ops Talk, and it just says how to set up and run the Azure Cloud Shell locally. Um, and to answer Andrew a bit more specifically, what drove me to do this the first time is when we were setting up environment to run um, at the beginning of the year uh, with MITT, where we had scripts that would set up an entire environment to set up for our demos during the, the, the live um, uh, sessions. Well, some of those scripts would take more than 20 minutes. So you start the script, you walk away, and we always did that in Cloud Shell because we were on the road. So you're not sitting in your home office and you're not sitting uh, somewhere where you're, um, you got access to this all the stuff locally. So we were running that in the Cloud Shell, and then you start, and then you get up in the hotel room and you walk over to the mini bar and make yourself a cup of coffee. Uh, and then by the time you come back to your, your desk, then you get that dreaded cloud shell timeout. So I've had that so many times uh, that it, it just drove me nuts. And, and I contacted the team and said, is there any way to whitelist our, our account so we can get more time? And they said, no, 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 no. And eventually I just kind of, 
asked them, I said, is there any way to uh, run that? Because we knew that this was running in a container somewhere. So it's anywhere we can get access to the container. And they said, well, we're working on that. And it took a while. And eventually, they released uh, the link to, uh, or through GitHub uh, where they were putting the container. And as soon as I saw that, I grabbed it and set it up on my machine. So I, that's the number one thing why I'm, I'm doing this, because now I don't have to worry about that, that dreaded 20-minute timeout. No, that's awesome. Um, yeah, so Pierre, um, with that, I, I really want to say uh, thank you for joining. And as Gren, thank you very much for create, uh, or, or organizing, recording such a great session, because for me, that was really, really, really helpful. And I think for a lot of people out there watching um, that video and that session from our IT Ops Talks event, I think they're going to be very happy about it. Uh, so I want to say thank you. Uh, and we should definitely do another live stream together and maybe watch some other sessions together. Sure. Um, uh, we'll maybe next bigger. time I, I react to one of your videos and you can watch me react to your <laughs> videos because it's kind of weird when you're watching, your, you're watching somebody watch yourself. Yeah, it would be definitely interesting. Definitely uh, feel free to do that. And also maybe we should watch one together. Like uh, always interesting to like watch one of Anthony's or Oren's or Sonia or Sarah's session uh, together and comment on that. But we will see what we will do. Uh, if someone who watches these videos, please write in the chat or leave a comment on what session you want to watch together. And we will see if we can make that. Other than that, Check out our event page. Go to aka.ms slash ITOps talks, where you actually can find more sessions, more videos from our events, and obviously a lot of other great content. So with that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, and hopefully see you soon in another one. Thank you.